in this video, we're going to create a recipe app that lets us search recipes from a third party API and display the results. We'll also add a pop up that appears whenever we click on a recipe that gives us more information about that recipe. And we'll add functionality that lets us save favorite recipes to our database and we can see the favorites in the favorites tab. If you want to save a bit of time in setting up the front end and back end from scratch, you can grab the starter code at Code Coyotes. This has some of the boilerplate for the front end and back end, some of the UI components, some of the back end endpoints, as well as the complete CSS you'll need for the tutorial. At Code Coyotes, you can also find the completed code, the text version of this tutorial, and hints and tips if you want to try the project yourself first. So I've got a diagram here that shows how all the different bits and pieces of our app are going to fit together. So we're going to have a React front end and we're going to have a Node back end. And these two are going to communicate with each other through some endpoints. We're going to have five endpoints that all live on our back end, but we can think about them um, in two different groups. The first group is going to be for the recipe search. And what that's going to do is it's going to call the recipe API and return the results based on a search query. So our front end is going to call our back end and then we will pass on the search request to the, the recipe API. So we don't want to call the recipe API directly from our front end like this because the recipe API, which is this bit, requires an API key. So an API key is like a password and we don't want to expose this password in our front end code. So if someone tried hard enough, they could go into our front end on their own browser and they could dig through the code and eventually pull out the API key. It's uh, a better practice to store the API key on our back end for environment variables and use it to call the recipe API from there and then pass the request back to our front end. This is typically how uh, it's done in production environments. It also means that we can do extra things on the back end to the data if we need to before we send it back to our front end. It also gives us the added benefit of performance as it means the UI isn't going to have to do a bunch of API requests back and forward to the recipe API. So that's how our search is going to work. So we're also going to have a bunch of endpoints that lets us add, create and delete favorites. So the favorites is going to be stored on our own database. Hopefully that gives you an idea of what we're going to build. And if you find this sort of overview helpful, let me know in the comments. I can go into more detail in future. Okay, so we're going to start off by creating our full stack application. So we'll create the back end and we'll create the front end and we will connect it to a database and then we'll go and get an API key that we will need to use to communicate to the recipe API. There's a bit to do here. If you would prefer to skip the setup, you can get the starter code from Code Coyotes, which will have this set up for you as well as some starter code like the CSS and things like that. You still have to create um, a database yourself and get an API key yourself, but it should make the process a bit smoother. And if not, you can follow along with me here. I've got Visual Studio code open here, just a blank window. And what we're going to do is on the desktop or wherever you want your project to live, we're going to add a new folder and we're going to call it recipe app. And then we'll drag this in to the Visual Studio Code window. And it's going to appear in the Explorer. So what we're going to do is have our front end code and our back end code in here as well, just to make it easier to keep track of where things are and follow along with the tutorial. So in here, we'll create the back end first. So in the Explorer panel here, we'll add a new folder and we'll call it back end. And once we've done that, what we're going to do now um, is open a terminal. So we can go to view and down to terminal. And we're going to make sure that we're in the back end directory. We'll do cd back end. And in here, we're going to type npm init. So this will create an NPM package for us, which gives us access to all the things that we'll need to make the, the backend run, like express a node and so on. Go ahead and hit enter. And it's going to ask you to fill out a wizard thing here, but you can go ahead and hit enter for the package name and same for the version, the description, 
can be skipped as well. And for our entry point, what we want to do in here is do dot slash source slash index dot ts. So we're going to be using TypeScript for this. And every, everything's going to be in our source folder. So hit enter and you can skip the test command and all this other stuff. At the end, it's going to say, is this okay? And I hit enter again. And now in the explorer panel here, if we expand the back end, you can see we have a package JSON. So if we go ahead and click into this, you can see it has all the stuff that we selected in the wizard. So that's good. Now what we have to do is install a whole bunch of dependencies to get this to work. We'll type npm i, which means npm install. And then we'll say express. So express is going to handle the API requests for us. And we'll say Prisma. Prisma is going to be used to connect to our database from the code. And then we'll say at Prisma slash client. Prisma client lets us interact with the database in a developer friendly way using objects and types and things like that. And then we'll type cores. So cores is a security thing that lets us make requests to this backend from our UI from a different port without given any errors. And then go ahead and hit enter and it should install all these things for us. Once that's done, you should see in the file explorer off to the left that we now have some node modules and a package lock JSON. So that means our dependencies have installed. Okay, so now we're going to go and install some dev dependencies. This is just to make our dev experience a bit better. We'll say npm i and then we'll say ts node as we want all the TypeScript types for node. Then we'll install TypeScript itself and then we'll say nodemon. Nodemon is used to actually start our backend and it gives us nice things like hot reloading whenever we save uh, and things like that. Next we'll type at types slash cores at types slash express types slash node and then we'll do dash dev so all these things with at types in front of it is basically the types for that package even though we've installed express and node and things like that before the types come in a separate package so we have to add them to your dev dependencies you can also find these commands in the link in the description where you can go and copy and paste them as well just in case you've hit any errors so far so go ahead and hit enter and speaking of errors we have one here it looks like i spelled something wrong so if we have a look yeah so it's course c-o-r-s so if we try this again okay so all being well you should see that it's added a bunch of packages and if you want to double check you can go into your package json again and in here you should see our dependencies and you should see our dev dependencies okay so that's our dependencies out of the way next what we can do is in our backend folder what we want to do is add a new folder called source and in here we're going to add a file called index.ts so this is where i guess the bulk of our backend code is going to live and it's going to have the code to start our app and handle the endpoints. So we can go ahead and start importing some of the dependencies that we've added in here. So we'll say import express from express and because we're using TypeScript you can see we've got an IntelliSense and stuff whenever we typing so that's nice. And next we'll import cores from course and what we can do now is say const app equals express so this creates a new express app for us and then we want to say app.use express.json so this is um, a convenience thing which helps us convert the body of requests and responses that we make um, into json so we don't have to do it manually on every request um, on the next thing we'll say app.use course so that's that um, annoying security thing that we need to do okay so now we'll add um, an endpoint just so we can quickly test that things are working so we can do app.get and the first 
parameter that we pass in here uh, is going to be a string. So this is the endpoint that this function is going to handle. So we'll just say API slash recipe slash search. So this is one of the APIs we'll need. And then the second parameter is going to be an async function. So we'll use the async keyword and then we'll open our brackets. And then here we'll say rec and res. So this just means request and response. And then we'll use an arrow function here to add the body of our function. And then in here, we're just going to say res.json. And we'll just pass uh, an object in here, which has message and says success. All we've done here is say return a success message as part of the response whenever this endpoint is called. So we'll add more stuff to this later as we go through the tutorial just to flesh it out a bit. But for now, we just want to make sure that things are working. And outside this function, we'll take a new line. And the last thing we need to do is start the app. So you can say app.listen. And this will be a function as well. And the first parameter is going to be the port that we want to start it on. So it doesn't really matter what you want to put in here, but we're going to be using 5000 for this tutorial. And that's what the starter code is going to be using as well. So just keep that in mind. And then the second parameter isn't necessary, but it's a helpful thing to have. So we'll pass a function in. And this is just code that runs after the app has successfully started. So I'll say console.log and then just pass uh, some text in. So say server running on local host and that should be it. So now what we can do is add a command to our package JSON, which makes it easier for us to start the server. If we go to package JSON and we will scroll to the scripts section so we can delete this test one as we don't need it. And then we'll replace it with our own called start. This is uh, the name of the command. And our command is going to be mpx node mod. So what's going to happen is whenever we type npm start, it's going to use node mod to start our server. And it knows where our server is because we defined it in here in the main property. It knows to go to source slash index.tts. So now if we save this, open up our terminal again, and then make sure you're in the backend section and then do npm start. Hopefully it works. I got an error here which says address in use. So this means that the port is being used in a different app. I have something else started on localhost 5000. This is why we're seeing this. I just close the other thing. And now if I start this again, it should hopefully work. Yeah, so now it says running on localhost 5000. Okay, so now we can open up a browser. And if we go to localhost slash 5000 slash API slash recipe slash search. So that's where our endpoint is. And if I hit enter, you can see we've got our success message here. So our back end seems to be working okay. Okay, so next what we need to do is get ourselves a database set up. So for this, we're going to use Postgres. If you have experience with using Postgres and stuff, you can set it up however you want, really, based on your preference. So if you want to set it up on your own machine using localhost, that's fine. But what we're going to do is use Elephant SQL. But what we're going to do today is use Elephant SQL. This just makes it really easy to set up um, a hosted database for us. And it means that if you ever host your project online, that you can easily connect to this database as well. It's up to you, but for this, if you want to follow along, you want to go to elephantsql.com and it says get and manage database today. We're going to click that. And then there's a tiny turtle thing here that you want to click. So this is like the free instance. So you don't have to pay for stuff if you don't want to. So yeah, go ahead and sign in. And then it's going to bring you to the create new instance page. So there's some warnings up here about no credit card found and things like that. You can ignore those. Those are only necessary if you're going to be paying for the advanced plans, but we're not doing that today. And um, so if you scroll down, we have to enter a name for our 
database, so you can call it whatever you want. I'm just going to be call it recipe app DB. Keep the plan on the free plan, and you can skip the tags. And on the bottom panel here, go ahead and click select region, and then this will bring us to the region drop down. So you can go ahead and just select the closest one to your country. So mine is going to be EU West one, so I'll just keep that. And then click review and it'll bring us to a confirm page. You can check the stuff if you want. It doesn't matter too much. And then click on create instance and it shouldn't take too long to spin up. So I have a few set up already here, but if we click on the one you just created, it'll bring you to the details. There's some stuff here, like your username and your password and stuff. The most important thing is this URL. So that's what we're going to use to connect to the database from our backend. So there's um, a little copy button here. You can click that if you want, and I'll copy the string for you. And then we'll go back into our code. And what we're going to do is open up the Explorer again. And in the backend folder, we're going to create a new file, .env. So you can see that the little icon here has changed to a gear. So this is what's called an environments file. And this is where you put things like database connections, API keys, and things like that, that are going to be specific to a given environment. And here we'll type database underscore URL, and then we'll do equals. And then what you want to do is paste in the string that you just copied. So in our code, we're going to pull in this database URL and Prisma is going to do all the heavy lifting to connect to the database for us. So we'll do that next. Also make sure that you don't check in this file. So most .env files as it contains obviously the username and password to connect to your database. So if someone gets a hold of this string, then they'll be able to connect to your database and do all sorts of stuff, which we don't want. So you can go ahead and save this file and close out of this. Now we want to open up a terminal again. And if you have your server running, you can just stop by doing control C or command C on Mac, I think it is. And just make sure we're in the back end directory still. And in here we'll type MPX Prisma init. So this is going to initialize uh, some Prisma stuff for us using the database URL that we just added. So hit enter and then it's got a bunch of like instructions and stuff on how to connect to different databases. You don't have to worry too much about this as we're going to go through it step by step. But this basically means that it worked. You can see that Prisma said it would have added a database URL environment variable, but it already exists. So that's good. It means it's reading our end file. OK. And then if we have a look at the file explorer, you should see we have a Prisma folder. So if we click on this, it'll have a schema.prisma. So we'll open this just to have a quick look. And in here, you can see that it's detected our data source settings from our string. So it's pulled in the environment variable and it's seen that we're using a Postgres database. This seems to be working OK. So it's usually good to check things are working every now and again. So we'll just start our server quickly and see if our API still works. So we'll do npm start. So that's good server running it's on localhost means that it started. We'll jump back to the browser and if we go to our endpoint, localhost 5000 slash API slash recipes slash search and hit enter get our success message back. So that's good. So as we go into the tutorial, we'll do more stuff in this schema.prisma file where we will set up tables for our favorites and perform the CRUD operations and stuff on that table. But for now, we're just going to leave it as it is. And I think we'll look at how to make an API call to the recipe app and see what that looks like. OK, so now we'll go and get an API key for recipe API that we're going to use.
will use this to search for recipes based on the search term and display these on the UI eventually. So if you go to spinacular.com, you can see there's a, a button up here that says start now. So we'll click this and go ahead and sign up. Once you've signed up, you should hopefully see a dashboard. If not, click on the My Console button up here. And on the left hand side, what we're going to do is go into Profile. And then there should be some stuff here around API keys. So we can generate a key and then we can show and hide a key. So what we want to do is we want to take this key and jump back into our code. And then in the File Explorer, we will go to our .env file again. And in here, we want to create a new environment variable called API underscore and then just go ahead and paste this in here and then click save. So now what we'll do is we'll test our API key against the recipe API just to make sure that things are working. And we will do this using uh, an API client. So you can use something like Postman or similar if you want. I'm going to use Thunder client, which is nice because uh, it's built into Visual Studio Code. So if you're following along, you can go into the extensions tab and search for Thunder client and install it from here. So it'll be the purple icon. And once you've done that, if you have a look on the left hand side activity bar thing, it should appear in here. So it's if you click on Thunder client, it's going to open up this little panel here and what we'll do is click new request. So there's a few options and things that we have in here. So in the query tab, what we're going to do is add a new parameter, which will hold our API key. So we'll say API key and make sure that it's a capital K. And then the value is going to be the API key that you just took from a dashboard in the rest website. It'll appear in the top here. So obviously this get URL isn't the right one. So what we'll do is we'll go back into uh, the recipe website and have a look at the docs. So this is documentation. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can do with this endpoint. But the main one that we're going to look at is the search recipes endpoint. So if you click on search recipes on the left, you can see it tells us what endpoint to use. And if we scroll down, you can see the list of parameters that it gives us. What we're going to do is copy this endpoint. So everything from the HTTP right to the end. And then we're going to jump back in our code. And then we're going to paste it into the URL bar. So if we paste it like this, and if we hit send, let's see what happens. Okay, so we've got a 200 response, which is good. And it's given us a whole bunch of results. So we've got uh, the title and we've got an image and an image type. So this seems to be working. What we want to do is pass in a search term as well, just to filter uh, the, the results because it looks like it's given us back some default values based on something. Don't really know what. So if we look at the documentation again, you can see this top parameter called query is the recipe search query. So we can use this to specify a search term. So we'll jump back into our Thunder client again in Visual Studio and we'll add a new parameter called query. And then we'll just put something in. Doesn't really matter. I'm going to say burgers. And if we click send again, and if we look at the response, yeah, 200 okay. And if we have a look at some of these, they should all be burgers. Yeah, so we have turkey burgers, salmon burger, and so on. So this all seems to be working. So all we've really done is proved that uh, our API key works and that we're able to call the recipe API without having to worry about hooking in our backend and stuff. At this point, it just makes it easier to track down any 
problems that we come across if we test each of the little bits in isolation. Okay, now we've got this working. The next thing we'll do is we'll call this endpoint from our back end and we will pass in the API key from our environment variables and we'll pass in a search term from the request that we make to our back end. So if we have a quick look at our little diagram again, we're going to be building out this bit next. So we um, don't have a front end yet, but we have the search endpoint in place. So we'll use this to test these two little bits. And once this is working, we can build our front end and start displaying some things. So we're in our index.ts file in our backend source folder. And what we're going to do is create a new file, which is going to hold all the logic that we'll call the recipe API. So the reason we're doing this is just to split out the recipe API logic from the rest of the server logic that we have in here. We will open up our Explorer here and in the source folder, we will create a new file and we'll call it recipe api.ts. And then here, we're going to create a new constant called API key. And this is going to be the API key that we saved in the environment variables. So we'll say process.env.api underscore key. And now we'll create a function called search recipes. So say const search recipes is equal to uh, an arrow function. And then we'll open our braces. So this function is going to accept two parameters. And the first one will be the search term as we need to know what these are searched for, and this will be a string. And then the second one will be the page, as we need to know what page the front end is requesting. And this will be of type number. So in here, you're just going to do a check that says if the API key is empty, null, undefined, or whatever, then we want to throw a new error that says API key not found. So if we don't have an API key, then none of the app is going to work. So it's good to handle this case early. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to define a variable that holds the URL of our recipe endpoint. So we'll say const URL is going to be equal to URL. So we'll create a URL object, which helps us things like parameters and path parameters a lot easier, as we'll see in a second. So in here, it's going to be a string. So what we can do is go back to our request and we want to take the endpoint. We don't want the query parameters yet. We'll add those in a second. What we want is just the base URL. So we can copy this and then we'll paste it in here just like that. Now we have a URL. We can start adding the query parameters. So this is going to be things like the API key and then the search term and also our paged info. We'll say const query params and it's just going to be equal to an object. And in here, we'll add our API key. So we can say API key is going to be API key. And if you want, you can do the shorthand version of this. So since the key is the same name as a variable, we can just say this API key and it will automatically add the key and the value for us. And we're going to say query. So this is the query that we send to the recipe API. And we're going to get this from the search term. So we'll say query colon is going to be search term. And then the number. So this is how many recipes we want per request. And I've just taken this from the API docs. So if you have a look, you'll see this value there along with these other values that we need. So this is all in the documentation. The number will say 10. So it doesn't matter too much what you put here, but 10 for now. And then the offset is the page data. So uh, we'll have to do some maths in here. So we'll open our 
braces and then we'll say page times 10. So what we're saying here is whatever page that the front end requesting, then we want to offset or skip the page times 10. So for example, so if the UI is asking for the second page, then what we want to do is skip the first page, or in other words, we want to skip the first 10 results. So that'll be 10 times one equals 10 and so on. So hopefully it becomes clear as we see a few examples later. And then we'll have to do two string as our query params must be in the form of a string. Okay, good. So now we have this. What we can do is attach these query params to our URL. So we'll say URL dot search. And then we'll say equals new search params. Then we'll open our braces and we'll pass in our query params. Then we'll say to string just to convert the object to a string. What this is going to do is it's going to attach each of these key value pairs to the end of the URL up here. So it's going to look similar to how we've done it here, where we have um, a question mark and an API key equals. And then we have the ampersand and then query equals. So it just means we don't have to build this string up by ourselves and it's a lot more cleaner. So you could add a bunch of query parameters in here if you wanted, and it would be much easier to maintain going forward. Okay, so now we've got our endpoint and our search. What we'll do now is actually make the request. So we'll open up a try catch block in here. So we'll say try catch. And the reason we do this is because we don't want our app to crash if something happens with the actual request. So any errors we get back are going to be caught in the catch block and then we can handle them accordingly. So in the try, what we're going to do is say const search response is equal to await fetch and then we'll just pass in our URL. So this is going to take the URL we just created. It's going to Make the fetch request and then it's going to assign the response to a search response variable. So we have an error that says, so if we have a look at the problems bit or if you hover over it, you should be able to see the error. So we've got a problem that says await expressions are only allowed within async functions. So that probably means we forgot the async keyword when we created the function. We scroll up the very top. Yeah. So our search recipes function has to be an async function because we have async code within this function. So if you just add the async just after the first equals, scroll down to see if it fixed it and it has. So that's good. So once this has happened, fetch request has happened, and it's going to give us back a, a full HTTP TTP response. But what we want to do is get the, the data from the body, which is going to contain all our recipes. We can do const results JSON, and then we'll just say await search search response JSON. So this is going to handle it for us and assign the data to the results JSON. And then what we want to do is return this. So return results JSON. So in the catch block, what we'll do is say console.log error. So if you're having any problems up until this point, have a look at the terminal in your IDE and hopefully you'll see any problems appear there. Okay, so we've got our fetch request and it's returning the results JSON. So now we have to call this function, search recipes function, from our own get endpoint in index.ts. We'll jump back into index.ts and what we'll do is we'll import the function that we just created. So we'll go to the top and take a new line at the end of our import statements. And we'll say import star as recipe API from, and then open some quotes and then do dot slash recipe API. And we have a problem again. So if we have a look, our problems tab, it says, so it looks like it's saying that the recipe dash API is not a module. So 
what that means is we probably forgot to export something so if we look at recipe dash api again we have our function but it's not been exported from this file so it can't be read anywhere so what we can do is say export and that looks like it's fixed our error so i'll jump back and you can see it's gone so the reason we're important star as recipe api is that we're going to have a bunch more functions in the recipe dash api file that makes requests to the recipe endpoint so uh, it just means that we don't have to have a bunch of import statements at the top here we can just have one single import statement and then use the recipe api object to access those functions if we go to the search endpoint and we can delete this res.json and here we'll say const results is going to be equal to recipe api dot search recipes and then open and close brackets we have an error now and it's expected because it says expected two arguments but got zero so this is typescript being helpful as you can see it's saying an arguments for search term was not provided so we need to pass in a search term and pass in a page so to do this we are going to get the search term and get the page from the request that gets sent to our back end from the front end for example we're going to have get request to http slash local host slash api slash recipe slash search and then it's going to have search term it's going to be whatever for example burgers and it's going to have a page of a number for example the first time the ui calls this it's going to have a page of one we just need to get these values from the url to do this we'll say const search term going to be equal to request dot say request and then dot and then we can use intellisense here to help us so if we type query this will give us all the query parameters that were sent to us and then we'll do dot and the name of the query parameter that we want so in this case it'll be search term and then we'll say as string as we want to get this back as a string and assign it to search term and then we can do the same for page so say const page equals request dot query dot page as a string and this is going to be slightly different because we said it's a string here but if we try and pass it to our search recipes endpoint so we'll pass in search term first and then page it'll give us an error and says whoops there's a extra thing up here it says problems argument of type string is not assignable to type number so what we need to do is convert it to an int so in here what we'll do is we'll say parse int so this converts a string to an int and returns the value as you can see the error is gone now and the reason we have to convert it to a string first is because the query object type is strange so if i take this away you can see that the type can be a string or a string array or undefined so we need to convert it explicitly to a string so that we can turn it into an int and we'll add some error handling later on just to make sure that these values exist before we try and cast them like this but for now this is okay as it gets us going now we have the results which we're going to get back from our new function we can return this in the response of our get endpoint so we have a response object up here which we'll use for this and then around line 15 just towards the bottom of the function what we'll say is return res.json so this is going to return json and we have to pass in the results just like this so it'll convert the results that we get back from the search recipes function assign it to results and then return the whole thing as json we can delete our comment and tidy up our code a bit okay so now we can test our endpoint so you can do this a few ways because it's a get request you can use the browser or if you want you can use funder client and um, it's all similar so it's probably a bit easier to see through the browser so i'll jump into 
the browser here. So we want to change our URL a bit so that we are passing in query parameters along with the API request. So we have localhost 5000 slash API slash recipe slash search. And we'll do a question mark to indicate that we're passing in some query parameters. And we'll say the search term will be burgers. And then we'll use an ampersand and say page equals. So if we hit enter, get nothing back. So something's gone wrong. Let's have a look. Let's jump back into the code. Hopefully there will be something in our terminal. We open up the terminal. Yep, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So app crashed. So if we scroll up, oh, our error was thrown. So our API key is not found. Let's have a look at that. If we open up the back end, our end file. So our API key is there. Probably just need to restart the server because environment files aren't hot reloaded. If you haven't done this already, then you've probably hit the same thing. You just want to stop the server with Control C or Command C if you're on a Mac and then do npm start. Hopefully this fixes everything. Okay, so it started okay. And then let's have a look at the browser again. And yeah, so we'll keep the same request and hit enter. I figured out what we need to do. So if we jump back into the code, we need to install a new package. So if we stop our server again, we need to do npm i dot env. So what this does is it lets node read the environments file at runtime. So I thought this package was part of the more recent node versions. Obviously not. So if you go ahead and install this, and the other change we need to make is if we go into our index.ts file and we need to add the wait keyword in front of our search recipe function call. What was happening here is that the code was returning before this function had completed. So the wait keyword will mean that it waits for this line to complete before it returns the results. And the second problem we had was that we were seeing this error because process.env.api key was null. So the .env package will hopefully fix this. And let's try this again. Hopefully third time lucky. Let's make sure our server started. So make sure that you're in the backend folder and do npm start. And that's good. So if we go back to the browser and We'll just fix our search term again. So it was we're searching for burgers and we want page one. Okay, finally. So we got some results back. And as you can see, each of the titles have burgers in the keyword or the title even. And we should have 10 results. Yeah, so we can see that at the bottom, the Recipe API um, has given us just some data. So we've got, there's a total of 50 results and we've asked for 10 and it's given us 10. And that means we have 10 items in the array. Okay, so this is good. We finally got it working. Um, if we look at our diagram again, what we've got now is we've got a backend which can securely call the recipe API based on a search term and any other parameters that we want to send as well. So you'll notice that in our URL that we didn't need to put in an API key or anything like that because that gets attached on our backend securely on the server before the request goes to uh, the recipe API and then ev everything gets returned. So now we have this. What we can do is we can build out our front end and call our node backend API and start displaying the results. So back in our project, we're going to open up uh, a terminal and then just make sure that you're in the top level or in the top folder. So it's recipe app. And then we're going to use beat to create a React app for us. So we'll do npm beat at latest and hit enter. And then it's going to ask us for a project name. So we'll just call this front end. So it's going to appear in our explorer within a front end folder. 
hit enter and then we're going to select react from this little list and then we'll say typescript plus swc so you don't have to know too much about this swc is meant to be a faster build thing so we'll use that and it says done and as you can see we've got a front end folder uh, in our explorer and it's given us some instructions down in here on what to do so we'll do that next so we'll do cd front end and then we'll do npm install finally we'll do npm start and it didn't work so what happened oh it's npm run dev instead okay so it worked that time and you can see it's given us an endpoint so this is where our app is if you press control and click it should open up in a browser yeah and you can see it's given us some stuff but this is what comes out of the box when we use feet so we've got a counter here for some reason and just some other stuff so it says edit app.tsx and so you have to test hot module replacement so this looks to be working so we'll jump back into the code and we'll keep this running and we'll just close down the terminal and we can close all these windows and then we'll jump into the front end folder so it's given us a bunch of stuff out of the box what we're going to do is jump into the source folder and what we'll do is let's see we'll go and delete the index.css file because we won't be needing that we can delete that and we'll go into the main.sx and we'll delete that import so it doesn't cause us any problems so save that and let's see if we go into app.tsx it's given us that counter thing that we've seen so we don't need that we will delete everything in here and we'll just create our app from scratch so we'll do import react from react and then we'll do const app to go to an arrow function and in here we'll just return some jsx we just had a div and then we'll say hello from recipe app and at the bottom we'll export default app and we can save this and if we have a look at the browser we can see that our text appears and we're all set up so while we're here we'll just tidy up our style sheet as well so if we jump back into the code in the source folder there will be an app.css file this is where we'll put all our styles and there's a bunch of stuff in here already so we'll just delete everything actually we'll keep the root class in so we'll delete everything below that and we'll delete everything within uh, the root class but then we're going to add a font family and then we'll say it doesn't really matter what we want in here just something that looks a bit more up to date than Times New Roman so I'm just going to pick Helvetica and hit save and then we'll jump back into our browser and yeah so the text looks a, a bit nicer back in app.tsx we'll import the style sheet before we forget so we'll do app and then dot slash app.css like that and it looks like we don't have to import react anymore so i'm going to remove this Let's just double check everything's working and it is okay so now that we have our ui set up what we'll do is we'll call our back end from within our front end code here and we will display the results uh, on the ui so if we have a look at the finished um, example that i've got started here so you can find this um, at code coyotes if you want to run it yourself we have input here which will take um, a search input so if i type burgers from hit enter then it's going to display the results that come back from the api so there's a few things that we need here before we can get this working so we need to know the search input that the user has entered and we also need um, a way to display these uh, recipe cards so what we'll do is we'll store both of these things in state so we'll jump back into our code 
and in our app component what we'll do is create our first state object we'll say const open braces and then we'll say search term comma set search term it's going to be equal to new state and we'll open our brackets and then we'll just initialize this to be an empty string and we have an error so we'll probably have to import this if you look at your problems tab it says can't find name so if you go to the top and do import open braces use state from open quotes and type react you can see that this will fix it so this is important to use state hook which we're using down here and we have the search term which is always going to give us the most up-to-date value of the state object and then we have a way to update the state object which we've called set search term eventually we'll tie this into a form where we will capture the user input but for now we'll just hard code a value that we'll use to test our api project to make sure everything's working so we'll just say burgers next we we'll want a way to store the recipe so that anytime the user changes their search term and the input that we'll have that UI updates. So anytime you have something on your UI that will update based on user input or otherwise, it's a good idea to put it in state. We'll do similar to above. We'll say const open square brackets, and then we'll say recipes, comma, set recipes. And this is going to be equal to use state as well. And in here, we're going to put an empty array because we know that our API is going to return an array. So if we look at this in the browser, just to remind ourselves, we have response object and then the results property within that is going to have an array of our recipes. So this is what we'll end up storing in state. So we'll jump back into our code. And now what we want to do is we want to add an event handler that gets called when the user hits enter in our form. And this event handler is going to call our backend search endpoint. So just beneath our state objects, we will say const handle search submit. And this is going to be equal to an async function. So it's async because we're making an API call in here. And then we'll add a try catch block. It's a good idea to add a try catch block anytime you are making an API call as it means we can handle any errors in the catch. So in here, we'll say const recipes. It's going to be equal to await API dot search recipes and open braces. And then we'll pass in our search term and we'll pass in a page. So we'll just default this to one for now. And in the catch, we'll just console.log the error. So we have a few errors here. This handle search submit and the recipes variable isn't used yet, so that's okay. And we haven't created our search recipes function. So what this api.search recipes will do when we create it next is it's going to contain the logic to call our API. So the reason we put this in a separate function is it splits out our components and our data fetching logic. So it helps to tidy up the code and it makes the things a bit easier to find. What we can do now is open up our explorer and in the front end source folder of our code, what we'll do is add a new file and then we'll call this api.ts. When here we'll create the function that we'll call our API search endpoint. So we'll say const search recipes is equal to async open braces and then it will accept the search term, which is going to be of type string and a page which will be of type number and we'll open our braces and forget to make sure that this is an arrow function now we've got our function body so in here what we want to do is say const base url so this is going to be the url of where our endpoint is which is going to be http localhost 5000 slash api slash recipes slash search so this is where our endpoint is on our node backend. And we'll just make sure that this is a URL by wrapping it in a new URL object. So this just makes it easier to add 
um, our query params, which is going to be the search term and the page, as these things are required by our API. So take a new line, and then we'll say base URL dot search params, and then we'll do append, and then here we'll give it the key. So the key is search term, comma, search term. And then we'll do the same for base URL dot search params append and we'll append the page comma page so we have a few errors the first one is that our page type should be lowercase n so that's okay and this one this one is saying argument of type number is not assignable to a string so that's okay because our ui is going to then pass this in as um, a number so all we have to do here is convert it to a string so there's a few ways to do this, but the simplest is probably to do string open braces and add an extra brace to the end. So this will convert the number to a string. Okay, so now we've got our params added to the URL. What we can do now is make the fetch request. So say const response is equal to await fetch, and then we'll just pass in the URL like this. And then we'll do a check to say if response is not okay then we will throw a new error and in here we'll use a template string to say http error status and then we will append the status code from the response so say response dot status if anything goes wrong here then we'll just throw an error with the status code and that will give us an idea of what went wrong if everything went as planned, then what we can do is return response JSON. So this will take the body and then return it back to whatever function called search recipes. And the last thing we have to do here is export this. When we export a function, it means we can use it within our component. So if we save this and if we jump back to app.tsx at the top, we can do import star as api from open quotes and then we'll do dot slash api and what this will do is it will import all the functions from our api.ts file so we currently only have one but we'll have some more as we go forward and assigns everything to the api object so this is nice because it means we only have one variable that we need to access to be able to use the functions from our API. As you can see down in our handle search submit function, the error is gone. And the other benefit we have of doing things like this is that it gives us IntelliSense. So if we type API dot, you can see that it gives us the list of functions that we can use. And it also tells us what the arguments are. And it also gives us a return type. So even though we haven't specified a return type, TypeScript will try and figure out what it is based on the code. Now we have some recipes assigned to the recipes variable that have been returned from our search recipes function call. So all we have to do now is set this into state. So we will use the set recipes function on the state object that we created earlier. We'll do set recipes, open our braces, and then we'll pass in uh, the recipes that we get back from the API. so once we've called set recipes it's going to update state and then this will trigger the component to re-render with the new data so we've added the logic we need now we just need to add some ui elements that will trigger this stuff we'll just add a button in that we'll call this handle search submit and then we will display the recipes and We'll do it quite rough for now just to see things working and then we'll come back later and add styling and CSS. So down in the return statement of our app function, we have the div that we added earlier. So I'm going to keep the div, but just delete the text within it. And then in here, we'll open our curly braces and then do recipes.map. And this will take a function. So we'll add an arrow function. and what we'll do is we'll add a div in here like this. So what this is going to do is it's going to iterate over the recipes array and then it's going to 
run this function for each item in the array. The function gives us the current item that the array is currently on in the form of a variable in here that we've defined. So we just call it recipe. And then in our code, we can do stuff with the recipe variables. We'll just display some properties for a recipe for now, just to make sure that things are working. So we'll say recipe image location and a colon. And then we can open braces and say recipe dot image. And then we'll say recipe title open braces. And then we'll say recipe dot title. There's some errors. So I'll talk about this in a second. But all we're doing here is we're taking each recipe and displaying some properties from it. So these properties come from our API. If we have a look at the browser again, we can see we've got these properties and every object in the results array has these properties as well. So this is where we're getting from when we say title and image. So if we look at these errors, then if we hover over it, it says property image does not exist on type never. So that happens because we're using TypeScript but we haven't told it what type that the recipe is. So if you hover over recipes, you can see it says it's a never array. So what we can do is we can create a type and then assign that type to our recipe variable. So if we open our Explorer again and in the source folder, we'll add a new file and then we'll call this types ts and in here we want to say export interface recipe and then open braces so there's two ways to create types in typescript you can use the interface keyword like we've done here or you can use the type keyword like this either way is fine it really comes down to preference i find the interface keyword is a bit better as it means you can do things like extend types and things like that but that's outside the scope of this basically a type is going to represent all the properties that an object has. So for our recipe, if we jump back to uh, the browser here and have a look, we know that each item or each object is going to have an ID, a title, an image, and an item type. So we need to create a type that represents this. What we can do is copy these properties, just the properties themselves, and we'll jump back into our code and then we'll paste it in. We're going to keep the keys, ID, title, image, and so on. But instead of values, we're just going to add what type that value should be. For ID, it's a number. For the title, it's going to be a string. And for image, it's going to be a string. And image type will be a string as well. And that's essentially it. If we jump back into app.txt, we can use this now. So if we scroll up to the top, the first place we can use this is with the use state hook. Just before the first brace of the use state hook, we're going to open some angle brackets and then we're going to say this state hook is going to contain an array of recipes. And just make sure to import it. Now that we've done this, we can scroll down to where our problem is and it's fixed everything. So now if we hover over the recipes, you can see that TypeScript knows that it's of type recipe and this means we have much better IntelliSense as well. So if I type recipe dot, you can see I have all the properties available to me and I don't need to jump back and forth between documentation and requests and things to see what properties I have. So this is one of the big benefits of TypeScript. Okay, so now we've got those errors sorted and and we're displaying recipes, we just need to add a button that will call our handle search submit function. So we'll just take a new line inside the first div and then we'll just add a button. So we're going to add uh, styles and things to this later, but for now we're just taking the quickest approach to make sure that things work. So we'll say submit and we'll put this button in a form while we're here because we'll be using a form later. So open some form tags and just place the button inside like this. And we want to say that the button is of type submit and on the form tag, we'll add an on submit function. 
and this would be an arrow function. And then here we'll call our handle. Anytime the button gets clicked, it's going to submit the form. And then the on submit function on the form is going to run and it's going to call our function handle search submit. And if we scroll up to handle search submit, it's going to call our search endpoint on the back end. Uh, it's going to hopefully get some recipes back and then it's going to set those recipes into state. Okay, so we added quite a bit of stuff there. So let's test it and see if it works. So if you open up your terminal, now that we have a front end and a back end, we have to start both of those separately. So the easiest way to do this is to click this little split button here, and then it's going to give you two terminals in one. So in one of the terminals, we're going to go into the front end directory and then we'll do npm run dev. This is going to start our front end and other terminal. We'll go into the back end and we'll do npm start. So that was the command to start the back end. So as you can see, both things are started now. We'll jump back into the browser and we will go into the UI, which is where is it? Yeah, so whenever you start the UI, it gives you the endpoint that it's on. So you can control click into this. It should open if your browser free. So there's our big submit button. And I'll open a network just to see things happening. You can go into your dev tools. And if you go to the network tab, you can see all the outbound requests that happen from your app. So this is nice to help debugging. And then you have your console tab as well. So these two tabs will hopefully give us a handle on any errors that we might have. So if we click the button, it should call our endpoint with the burgers search query, and then it should display some stuff and it doesn't. So something's gone wrong. Let's see if we can figure out what it was. Oh yeah. So it's probably difficult to see, but the URL in our browser here has attached a little question mark to the end. You'll notice that whenever I hit submit, that the form submitting, but it's refreshing the page. So what's happening here is that's a default behavior of a form to do a post back to itself, essentially. So that's not what we want. So if we go back into the code in our form tag, we'll add the event. When a form gets submitted, it passes the event to whatever code you specified here. We'll pass this event on to our function. And in the handle search submit function, if we scroll on up, in here, we will accept this parameter. So we'll just say event and this will be of type form event. And then in the body of our function, what we want to do is say event dot prevent default. And we have an error that says cannot find name form event. So we just need to import that. If you hover, click on the name and then go to the little light bulb that appears and then we'll just update import from react. So that does it for us. Okay. That's fixed the error. And what this will do is it'll stop that post back that was happening. So we'll save this and we'll go back and then we'll refresh the page and we'll clear our console and stuff. Now if we click submit, let's see what happens next. Okay. So we got an error, a bunch of errors. Let's see anything happened in the network. Okay. Things didn't work. And we have some clues as to why. So if we look at the network, we can see that it did in fact call the API. So that's one thing that we can rule out. If you click on the network request, it gives you a bit of an insight into stuff about the request. If we look at the payload, we can see that our search term and our page gets sent. Okay. So that's good. And if we click on preview, we can see, see that we did get some results back and it does have all our data in it. So. So we can rule out that it's an API error. So if we jump back to our console then, and then we'll see what the console says. So it's saying recipes.map isn't a function and it happens on line 26. So let's have a look at that. Yes, yeah, so what this means is that recipes isn't an array. So what we need to do in here is say recipes results. And the reason we have to do this is because if we look at the network response, you can see that this object here is what we stored in state. But what we actually want to do is just store the results as this is what's coming back from our API. If we save this change and go back to the browser, hopefully if we hit submit now, 
yeah so we've got some stuff displaying let's close this down to get a look and yeah so it's displaying our data we've got the recipe image location and then it's displaying it's displaying that image and then beside it is displaying the title so these are the properties that we this is the properties that we are displaying in our jsx so we have an image and then we've got our title okay so we have successfully connected our ui to the search endpoint that we created on our back end but we currently have a hard-coded search term so whenever we set up the state hook for our search term we hard coded the burgers properties anytime the button is clicked it triggers the api call it's always going to be burgers so what we want to do is add an input to capture the user's search term that they are looking for so down in our form inside the form tag we'll add an, imp an input just inside the first then we'll add some properties to this so say the type will be text required means that there must be a value present when the user submits the form otherwise they will see an error so this is handled by the browser for us which is nice and we'll add a placeholder that says enter a search term okay so when we're working with forms in react we have to handle the values ourselves we need to set up a state hook to capture the inputs and to handle the change of the input so we already have a state hook created called search term up here so we'll just use this so down in our input again we'll say the value of this input is going to be whatever the search term is and we'll add an on change and we'll pass in an arrow function and the on change property will pass the event to our function so in here we can say set search term and it's going to be event dot target value so anytime the user types entity input on each keystroke or if they paste the value in it's going to update our state with whatever that value is if we scroll up to our search term we can delete the burgers field and we'll just initialize it to be empty and since we're using TypeScript it's good practice to specify what the type is going to be for the state hook so it's going to be a string even though TypeScript can figure out that search term is going to be a string but it's good practice to be clear about it by specifying it here as other developers coming along after you can scan the code and see what types different variables are so now if we save this and then we'll jump back to the browser and you can see we've got our input here and we'll enter a search term so instead of burgers we'll try pasta and you can hit enter or click submit and you can see that we're getting our data back and it's displaying the text for the image location and for the title so if we have a look at some of these titles we can see they all contain pasta in the keyword and we'll check our validation here so if we delete the input and click submit we get a please fill in this field thing that the browser provides for us so that's good okay next what we'll do is we'll tidy up our jsx and and create the card component that will display this data in a recipe card so if you look at the finished example we have a bunch of cards that display the recipe and if we go to the favorites tab you can see that the favorites also have this card so since we know that we're going to be reusing this logic to display the recipes then we will create a new component for this so that we can reuse it so we'll jump back into our code and we'll go into the source folder and we'll create a new folder called components so this will hold all the components for our app and in here we'll create a new file and we'll call it recipe card.tsx make sure that it's tsx and hit enter 
And in here, we will create a new React component. So we'll say const recipe card is going to be equal to an arrow function. And since we will be passing the recipe to this recipe card, we will destructure it in the props. So we'll say recipe in here. And since we're using TypeScript, we can define the prop types similar to what we did with the recipes. At the top, we can say interface props and say the recipe object is going to be of type recipe. And it should import automatically from types. If not, you can import it yourself. And down in our component, we just have to add a colon after our destructuring and type props. In our body, we're going to type return and open our braces. So this is where the JSX will go. So we'll add a div and then we'll give this a class name of recipe card. Within this, we're going to display the image. So we'll add an image and we'll say the source is going to be equal to open braces and it'll be recipe dot image and below the image if we look at our finished example again so we'll have an image and then just below we'll have the title so we'll open up a div and we'll give this a class name of recipe card title and inside this we'll add our h3 and then we'll do recipe dot title and save this and at the bottom we'll export a default recipe card okay so now we have our recipe card and if we go back into app.t we'll scroll down until we see the code where we're displaying uh, the recipe data and instead of this div what we're going to do is display a recipe card so it's going to map over the recipes array and for each recipe we have we will display a recipe card so we have an error that says property recipe is missing in type but required in type props so what that means is that it's complaining because we haven't passed a required property so that's another benefit of typescript with react components it helps us identify when we have forgotten to add a property so if you click just inside the component and press control space you can see the list of properties that it accepts so it currently only accepts recipes so we'll click on recipe and then we'll pass in uh, the recipe that we're currently on in the map function which is this one here so we'll type recipe and that fixes our errors so we'll save this and we'll see what it looks like okay so that seems to have worked okay if we scroll down you can see each image is being displayed and just below it there's a title so this looks good so far but we're still only getting the first 10 results back okay so next we'll look at how to add add the view more functionality so if we look at our finished example if we scroll to the bottom here we've got a view more button if we click the view more button you can see it loads the next page of results and adds them to the end uh, of our recipe list here. So, so just to remind ourselves how this works is we'll jump back into our back end into index.ts. And if you can remember that we added a page query parameter to our recipe search endpoint. And then we pass this page value on to the recipe API where we specify an offset. So depending on what the page number is, it's going to skip the page number times the number per page. Return the results, which we will append to the existing recipes array that we already have on the UI. So to do this, we'll jump back into app.ts and We'll start by adding the button. So we'll scroll to the bottom. Just after the code where we map through the recipes, we'll take a new line and we'll add a button. We'll say button. 
and we'll give this a class name of view more and then we'll add some text which says view so whenever this button is clicked we will call a function that we haven't created yet but we'll create in a second so this function will be called handle view more just like that so now we'll scroll up and just outside the return function where we added our jsx after handle search submit we're going to create this function so say const handle view more click it's going to be equal to an arrow function so in here it's going to be similar to our handle search function and in, in that it's going to call the search recipes api and it's going to pass in the query and the current page with just a few tweaks so we'll start by adding a try catch since we will be making an api call so in the try we're going to say const next recipes and this will be equal to await ap dot search recipes so again the search recipes takes a search term and a page so we know what the search term is because we have it in state already that's one problem solved but we don't know what the page number is because we haven't stored that anywhere what we need to do is we need to keep track of what page the current user is on and we can do that by using the use ref hook it's a good idea to keep all state related things and variables and things like that at the top so it's easy to find them so just after our state hooks we will do const page number equals use ref and then we'll initialize it to one so the reason we're using the use ref instead of use state is because we don't want the app to re-render anytime the page number increments so what use ref does is that it keeps the value stored between the renders without re-rendering the entire so it's just a bit of a, a performance thing anytime you want to change something that causes a re-render you would use use state anytime you want to keep something that that doesn't cause a re-render you would use a use ref now we can use this in our function if we go down to handle view more click what we need to do is calculate what the next page value will be and then we can pass it on to uh, the search recipes api so we'll say const next page is going to equal page number current so whenever we're accessing a use ref we have to use the dot current method and then we'll say pin plus one space so page dot current is one then the next page will be one plus one which is two we can take this and we can pass it in like this and the catch block will just do console.log error and we have to add an async keyword because await expressions are only allowed within async functions. So in our function declaration, we'll just type async. Okay, so now whenever we call the search recipes API of the next page, we're going to get back the next 10 results. So it doesn't give us back all the previous results. It just gives us back that page. So what we need to do is we need to keep what we need to do is we need to append this to the end of our recipes array so that we don't lose the previous recipes that we fetched so we take a new line and we'll say set recipes recipes open our braces and then we'll create a new array so what we're going to do in here is we're going to do the three dot to copy the existing array and then we'll add a comma and then we'll add three dots again to say next recipes dot results so what this does is it creates a new array copies in the previous recipes that we currently have and it copies the next page of recipes that we just got back from the api and then it saves it to state and whenever we save to state this will trigger the app to re-render and display 
add a new array. So the last thing we must do is we need to save the current page number. So we can do this by saying page number dot current is equal to the next page. Okay, so we can save this and let's give it a go in the browser. So a few more buttons appeared. And so we'll type burgers and hit enter. And then, and then we've got the first page back. Just go to the bottom. If we click view more, you can see that we get the next page. And we can keep this up. And it'll keep adding on to the end of the list. So that worked first time, which was nice. So there's one little change that we're going to make before we move on. So in our code, we'll go to the handle search submit function. And what we want to do is we want to reset the page number back to one whenever the user enters a new search term, because we don't want to mix up the new recipes and display them along with the old ones. So we want to reset everything back to a clean slate. So to do this, after we've set the recipes, we'll take a new line and we'll do the same thing as what we did before. We'll say page number dot current is equal to one. So now we'll do some quick tests on our app. So we'll refresh and we'll add a search term and we'll check on the view more button. So we'll scroll down to the bottom. That looks good. And then we'll change the search term just to make sure that everything resets and we get a fresh list back of pasta and that looks good. Okay, so let's have a quick look at our architecture diagram and we've added the get request for the search recipe API and we've also added pagination, which is the green line here. So the next thing that we can do is we can add the modal that displays when we click on a recipe. So We'll jump back to our finished app again. And if we click on one of these cards, you can see we get this little modal appears and it's got a bunch of details just about the recipe with some links and stuff. So that's what we'll look at next. To add the modal that displays the recipe summary, we need to know where the summary data comes from. If we look at our search API, Remember, we only get back an ID, a title, and image type. We don't have any information about the summary here. But if we look at the documentation for our recipe app, we can see that there's an endpoint that they make available called Summarize Recipe. This generates a short description that summarizes key information about the recipe. That's what we want. And it looks like to get this, we need to do a get to this endpoint. and we have to specify an ID. And to do this, we'll do similar to what we did with the search endpoint. We'll look at our diagram again. We're going to have a API slash recipe ID slash summary endpoint that lives on our node backend. And our node backend will add an API key and it will forward the request on to the, to the summary endpoint on the recipe website that we just seen. This is the green line we're still following here. The approach is going to be very similar to before. We'll go ahead and jump into our code. And in the Explorer, we'll go back into our backend, into the source folder, and into recipe-api.ts. In here, this is where we added the logic to call our recipe website API to call a complex search endpoint. We'll do similar in here for uh, the summary. At the very bottom of the file, we'll take a few lines and then we'll say export const recipe summary. And this will be equal to an async. And remember, we need to know the recipe ID of the recipe summary that we're looking for. We'll add this as an argument. Say so recipe ID and it's going to be of type string. And then here we'll do const. URL is equal to new L. and we will go back to our recipe website and we'll just grab this endpoint here and we'll copy it and jump back into the code 
and we'll paste it in here in between some back ticks, just like this. We need to replace this ID with the recipe ID that we want the summary for. Since we're using a template string, we can use a dollar sign and add some curly braces, and then we'll type recipe ID. This will dynamically add the recipe ID to the endpoint string. We'll go ahead and save that. Next, we need to add our API key, just like we did before in the search endpoint to the query params. Say const params equals braces, and here we'll say API key, and then we'll do API key. We're getting the API key for the recipe website from the environment variables, and we have to find it. At the very top of the files, all our functions can get access to it. Back in our get recipe summary function, we can take a new line and we'll say url.search to build up the search params. It's going to be equal to new url search params. Open our braces and then we'll pass in this variable, this params variable, like this, and then we'll just do two string at the end so that it gets. Um, converted saying it's given us a TypeScript error which says property API key is incompatible with index signature because it could possibly be undefined. What this means is that API key is of type string or undefined but we can't pass undefined as a query param. All we have to do here is add a line to the top it says if API key is undefined or empty string or whatever. We can just do what we did in the search recipes function and we'll throw a new error. Just go ahead and copy this and we'll paste it in here. We'll say if we don't have an API key, we'll throw a new error and we'll pass in a message API key not found. This will help us with debugging and things like that. Okay, now that's fixed our error and we've constructed our URL that we want to send to the recipe website API. We just need to make the request now. We'll say const search response. We'll, so we'll say const response is equal to await fetch URL. And then we'll convert the response to JSON. Say const JSON equals await response.json and then in here we will return the json data out of the function now we have the logic that calls the api we have to create a new endpoint in our node backend which will call this function back in index.ts we this is where we have our endpoints we currently only have a search endpoint just below this we're going to say app get because we're making a get request and we'll say slash api slash recipes slash colon recipe id slash summary what the colon recipe id in here means is that this is a path param and we can get it in um, our function which we'll see in a second but the second argument that we need to pass to app.get is going to be our Function. We'll say async. This will be an arrow function. And then we'll open our braces. And express will pass in the request and the response for us. We'll just name those. And now in here, we can get at the recipe ID by saying const recipe ID is equal to rec, which is the request dot dot recipe ID. Now we have the recipe ID. We can call our API function. We'll say const results is equal to await recipe API dot and you can see in the IntelliSense the functions that are available to us. We'll call a function that we just created and open our braces. And then we'll pass in the recipe ID. And the last thing we'll do is we'll return 
this data as part of the response. Say return res dot, and we'll pass in the results. Just like this. Now we can test this API endpoint. We'll open up Thunder Client, and we'll click on new request. You can use the browser as well if you want, whichever you feel most comfortable with. In the URL, we're going to say http slash localhost colon 5000 slash api slash recipes and then we'll do slash and now we need a recipe id the best way to get one is to look at our other endpoint this is the search endpoint you can see the first result for burgers that we get back has an id of this number we can copy this and jump back into our code and we can paste it like that and then we'll do slash summary this will call our endpoint that we just created with this recipe id we'll click send and you can see we've got a 200 back which is good let's have a look at the data you can see here we've got the title and then we've got a summary which has a big long string of stuff in it this is what we'll use to populate our modal on the UI. We'll jump back into app.tx and then we'll open our explorer and then back into the project tree. We want to go into front end, source, and into components. And then we'll create a new component called recipe modal tsx. When here we're going to create a React component, so say const recipe modal equal to an arrow function and in here we will add our jsx for the modal we'll say return and inside this we'll add a react fragment because we're going to have multiple top level elements and in here we'll say div and this will be a class name of overlay if we look at the finished app again, uh, the overlay is going to be this grayish background that appears uh, behind the modal. Just so that the user's focused on uh, the modal content itself. Let's jump back into our code. And we'll add the styling for this in a second, but for now we'll just get the rest of the modal JSX in place. But beneath the overlay, we'll add a new div. This will be a class name of modal. And inside this modal div, we're going to have another div. This will have a class name of modal content. Inside modal content, we'll have a div with a class name of modal header. This is going to have our title. Inside modal header, we'll add a hitch to, we'll just add a dummy title for now. We'll say recipe title. And then We'll add a span. This will be for the close button. And then we'll say class name is close button. And inside this, we're just going to use ampersand and then times and then semicolons. This is just a quick way to get a, a cross button in. We'll save this. And then just outside the div for the modal header, but still inside modal content. We want to take a new line and we'll add a paragraph tag. And this is going to have the recipe summary. And at the bottom, we'll export default recipe modal. Since we want the modal to be overlaid over the rest of our app, we'll have to add some styles in here. If we go into Explorer, into the source folder, and then we'll go to app.css. We haven't added any styles up until this point, except the root. We can take a new line underneath. And this is where we'll add our styles. You can go to code coyotes if you want to copy and paste in all the CSS as opposed to typing everything out. Otherwise, you can follow along with me now. But the first thing we'll do is add our overlay class. This is for the modal background. We'll say position fixed. 0, left, 0, with 100%, and 
height 100%. What this does is it makes the div take up the whole screen and keeps it in place as we scroll them. We'll add a background color of RGB 0, 0, 0, 0.7. This is, this is basically a black background with an opposite of 0.7, which means it's a bit see through. Next, we'll add the styles for the modal. We'll say modal, and this will be position fixed as well. And then we'll say top 50%, left 50%. Then we'll say transform. Then we'll say Z index 2. Then we'll add a box shadow. Again, this basically keeps everything in the middle of the screen. And then we've added a Z index, which means to bring it to the front. And we need to add a Z index to our overlay as well. So go in here and we'll say Z index. And we'll change this Z index for the model to be two, actually. That it appears at the very front and that the overlay appears behind it. Okay, next we'll add the styles for modal header. This contains our title and our close button. We want to space these out evenly and we'll say display flex and we'll say flex direction row so that things appear in a row. Then we'll say align items center. Let's make sure that things are vertically centered and look even. Then we'll say justify content space between to handle the horizontal spacing. Next, we'll look at the modal content. We'll add a background color of white. We'll add padding of 2EM. And then we'll add a border radius just to curve the edges a bit to give it a nice look of 4 pixels. Doesn't really matter too much about these values. And then we'll do a max width of 500. Okay, so I think that should be it. Now we've created our modal and we've styled it. We will look at how to render it on, on our app. If we look at our finished um, example again, just to remind ourselves, whenever we select the recipe, we want the modal to appear. A good way to go about this is to store the selected recipe in state. Then we'll check the state value and if we have a selected recipe, then we'll display our modal. Let's do this. We jump into the code again. We're in app.tsx now. We'll scroll to the top and we'll add a new state variable. Say const open braces and I'll say selected recipe, comma set selected recipe. It's going to be equal to new state. And then we'll open our angle brackets and then we'll say this state variable can be either a recipe or it can be undefined because we might not necessarily have um, a selected recipe. And then we'll add our brackets after this and we'll initialize this to be undefined. Okay, so now we have a selected recipe and a way to update it in state. We'll scroll down to the very bottom of our JSX. Just after the button, we're going to add some logic to conditionally render the modal based on if we have a selected recipe or not. We'll open some braces. Then we'll say select the recipe. Then we'll add a question mark. Then we'll say if we do have a selected recipe, we want to render the recipe modal. Then we'll say a, a colon. And and we'll say null. This is basically like a shorthand if statement. So we check if this condition is true. If it is, then we run the first part of the statement. If it's not, then we run the second part. Now what we need to do is we need to update the selected recipe and state when a recipe card is clicked. We'll go into our recipe card and then we'll define a new prop under the props interface and then we'll say on click and then this is going to be a function we can define an arrow function and this function doesn't return anything so we'll say void and 
this function will have to accept a recipe and it's of type recipe. All we're in here is describing that the on click prop that gets passed to the recipe card has to be a function that accepts a recipe and doesn't return anything. Back in app.tsx, you can see we have an error now, and it says that our onClick function is required, but we haven't passed it in. We can do that now. We'll say onClick, and this will be equal to an arrow function. And what this function will do is update our selected recipe. We'll say set selected recipe, like this, open our braces, and then we're going to pass in. We're going to pass in the recipe that we're currently on in the map function to this function. We'll paste in recipe just like this and save. Now, now if we go to the browser and we search for something, if we click on a recipe, we should see the modal and if we don't, something's gone wrong. Let's have a look. We'll go back into our code and in app dot. TSX, it looks like we're passing in everything okay. Let's look at the recipe card. And yes, what's happening is we've passed in the on click function, but we haven't actually added it to anything here. In our recipe card, recipe card props, we'll do comma on click to destructure the on click that gets passed in. And at the very top level of the card, because we want this on click to happen regardless of where the user clicks. Say on click is equal to on click. And we can change this actually in the props because we don't need to specify that we pass in a recipe at this point because it gets passed in app.tsx whenever we have defined a function here. We can get rid of the arguments in the interface and hit save. That fixes our errors and we've added the click handler. We'll go back to the browser. We'll do burgers again and hit submit. Now if we click it, hopefully this time the modal appears. And it does. We have a title and then we've got the recipe summary. So now that we have the modal working, what we're going to do is whenever the modal opens, we're going to call our Call our summary endpoint that we created and get the recipe summary data and then display it here instead of displaying these hard coded titles. So to do this, we'll go back into our, our code and we'll go into the recipe modal. In here, we're going to create a state object to hold the recipe data so that we can display it whenever we make our API call. We'll say const recipe summary comma set recipe summary this will be equal to use state and we'll open and close our braces and we'll have to import a use state hook from react as always it's good to specify a type for our state hook since this is a custom object we'll have to create our own type just like before we know that when we make a request to the recipe API, as you can see uh, in here, whenever we call the summary API, it's going to give us back an ID, a title, and a summary. What we can do is take these properties and we will create a new type from it. We can go ahead and copy the properties. We'll go into the Explorer in our front end folder. We'll go into types under source and then here we'll create a new type we'll say export interface recipe summary and we'll open and close our brackets then we can paste in our properties and then we'll just change uh, the values we'll keep the keys just like we did in our recipe type up here for id it's going to be um, a number for the title it'll be a string and for the summary, it'll also be a string. And we'll save this. And now we have our type that describes the recipe summary response that we get back from our API. We can jump back into recipe modal.tsx and in our use state hooks within the angle brackets, we can add this type, say 
recipe summary. And now that we've done that, it means that we can use the recipe summary variable in our JSX instead of recipe title. We can open our braces and we'll say recipe summary dot title. Now the actual recipe summary is a bit interesting because if we look at it again in the request response, you can see that it's a string, but it's got lots of HTML in it. There's some bold tags here. If we scroll down, you can see we have links and so on. There's a built-in React property that we can add to our JSX to display a string containing HTML as actual HTML. What we'll do is we'll type dangerously set inner HTML. The clue is in the name here that we don't use this very often. We only use it from API sources that we trust uh, that, that doesn't contain any JavaScript script tags or any uh, suspicious code that we're not sure about. But since we trust this API and we have seen that it contains pure HTML, then this is the approach we take to do it. In here, we open our curly braces and then we do a double underscore, type HTML, and then colon. Then we'll type recipe summary dot, and then we just delete uh, the text that we added before in our p tags and save. We're getting this error because recipe summary could potentially be undefined. What we can do is we can add a conditional if statement here that says if we don't have a recipe summary, then just return some empty JSX. And if we scroll down, you can see that's fixed the issue and we can get rid of the question mark that the IntelliSense added for us. Okay, so now we have a way to display recipe summaries. We need to actually fetch the summary based on the selected recipe that the user clicked on. We're going to add this logic within our recipe model. And we want this to happen when the component loads for the first time, or in, in other words, whenever the modal opens. Underneath our state hooks, we're going to add the use effect hook. We'll say use effect, open our braces, and in here, we'll add an arrow function and pass in our function. Then we'll say const fetch recipe summary is equal to an async function, which will be an arrow function. The reason we need to create a function within the use effect hook is because use effect can't be async at the top level. Um, I think it gives an error. Yes, if you put async at the top level, it says use effect callbacks are synchronous, blah, 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 and then it says put the async function inside. It gives us an example of how to fetch data. We have a, a fetch data function here. It gets called straight away. It's a bit strange, but that's what they tell us to do. So that's what we'll do. But inside our fetch recipe function, we're going to add a try catch block. And then we'll say const recipe summary is going to be equal to await get recipe summary. And then we'll pass in a recipe ID. And once we've got the recipe, back from our API, we will set this into state. Say set recipe summary, summary recipes. I've named this backwards, but hopefully you get the idea. And then in the catch block, we will just do console log any errors. And just outside of the fetch recipe summary function that we just created, we're going to call the function. We'll do fetch recipe summary, open and close brackets. We have two things that we need to do next is that we need to write the actual fetch request and we need to get the recipe ID. So we'll write the fetch request first. If we open up our explorer under the front end source folder under API, this is where we wrote the code that calls the search recipe API, we'll do the same for the summary API call. We'll take a few new lines down here. 
Then we'll do export const get recipe summary, which is what we called our function in our component. And this will be a recipe, this will be a, an arrow function, and we'll accept the recipe ID as a string. Next, we'll define the URL of the endpoint. We'll say const URL equals, and then we'll say new braces. And we'll do this a bit differently than before because we're working with path parameters. And go into our request and we'll just copy the endpoint string and paste it in. And we're going to change the ID recipes slash we're going to do open a dollar sign open our square braces and we'll pass recipe id in there now our url for the summary the recipe summary endpoint is going to be http colon slash slash yeah, slash recipes and then whatever id we pass in which we're going to get from the selected recipe state value slash summary and this will make the request for us and this will be our URL. We'll do const response is equal to await fetch. And then we'll say URL. And then we'll take a new line. And and we'll say if the response is not okay, and we'll throw a new error that says HTTP error exclamation mark status response dot status. This will help us identify any issues and don't forget your async keyword on the function because we're making a fetch request. And then the last thing we'll do is we'll return response JSON, which will convert it to JSON for us. Now we have our fetch request. We can jump back into recipe modal and we just have to import this at the top. We'll do star as recipe API from open braces and do dot slash and do dot slash API and down in our use effect hook where the error is we'll type recipe API dot and that should fix it okay the last thing we need to do is we need to get the recipe from the app component and pass it into our recipe modal. To do this, we'll define a prop type for the recipe modal. We'll say interface props open braces and then we'll say recipe ID. That's going to be a string. And we don't need to pass the whole recipe in here as we're only using the ID that we get. There's no point passing a whole object around if we don't need it. And down in our recipe modal we can add our props we'll open curly braces we'll type recipe id and then just outside the last brace we'll define what our props are by saying colon props okay so we've fixed all the errors in here and everything looks good at a first glance now we just need to pass the recipe id in to this component we'll go back to app.tsx and down in the recipe modal, it's given us the error saying our prop recipe ID doesn't exist. But that's okay because we're, we're going to pass it in by saying recipe ID is equal to open braces and then we'll say selected recipe dot ID. And since we need this to be a string, we can say to string like this. The last thing we need to do to make this work is in recipe modal. Where we added the use effect hook what we want to do is we want to add what's called the dependency array at the end of our last curly brace for the function what we'll do is add a comma and then we'll add square brackets and we'll pass in the recipe id what this means is that this use effect logic is going to run anytime the recipe id changes if the user changes their selected recipe and closes the modal and selects another one, this logic will run to fetch the new recipe. If we didn't do that, then 
the old recipe summary would always stay persisted, even if the modal was closed. We can save this and we'll jump to the browser. And we'll try a search term. And if we click on this, you can see we've got some stuff appearing. This looks like we're displaying the ID, so we'll have to fix this. But our summary looks to be good, even though we get HTML back as a string when we display it on the renders the HTML as opposed to just displaying the string as it is, which would show things like the bold tags and the A tags for the link and stuff. So this is good. There's um, a few things we must fix here. We need to fix the title and we haven't got a close button. Let's look at that next. We'll jump back into the code. And if we go into recipe modal, let's look at our JSX to see. Yes, in our H2 tag, we displayed the ID by mistake. We can do recipe summary dot title. And for the close button, what we want to do is we want to reset the state object in app.tx, the selected recipe, to be undefined. The reason we set it to be undefined is because this will hide the modal. If we look at our logic that renders the recipe modal, it's only going to render if we have a selected recipe. And here, what we'll do is we'll pass in a new prop called on close. And this will be equal to an arrow function. And then here we'll say set selected recipe, open braces, and we'll just set that to be undefined. It's given an error because it's saying on close doesn't exist on recipe modal. We'll jump in the recipe modal and then we'll add this prop to our prop types. We'll say on close and then this is just going to be a function that returns void and in our component we can destructure this. We'll say on close and then we can attach this to our button in our JSX. It's the span of a class name of close button. We'll just add an on click property here. And then we'll just pass in our on close function that we get from props. So if we save this and if we click on it, it closes. And then, and then we'll click a different one. So this looks good. And then we close it again. Everything looks like it's working as our should. And we've completed our summary modal. Now that we have the summary modal in place, next we'll look at how to create, view, and delete the favorites. But if we look at our diagram again, we're going to add a few new endpoints to our node backend. And we'll also add a table to our database that will store the recipe ID of the favorite. Storing the ID of the favorites means that whenever we do a get request to get all our favorites, that we can use the IDs that we have stored and get the data that we need to populate the recipe cards from the API, which just means that we're not storing data that is duplicated in our database that already exists in the API. If the API data ever changes, we don't have to worry about updating the data in our database as it's unlikely that the ID will ever change. So the first thing we'll do is we'll go into our code and we'll create our table to save the favorites to. In our code, we'll go into the Explorer and in the backend folder, we should have a Prisma folder that we created at the start of the tutorial. If we open this and you can see we have a schema.prisma file in here. Using Prisma, we've already connected up to our database that we created on Elephant SQL. So what we'll do is create the model just beneath the data source object here. We'll take a new line and I will say model and then we'll say favorite recipes and I will open our braces. This model represents a database table. In our favorite recipes table, we will have two fields. We'll have an ID, which is going to be of type int. And then we'll say at ID to tell Prisma that we intend this to be a unique identifier. And then we'll say at default to say that we want to automatically increment the values as they are inserted into the table. So the first one 
that we add will be one and the next one we add will have an id of two and so on beneath this when we want to have a recipe id field and then this to be unique we can't save the same recipe twice now that we've done this we can open up a terminal and in here we want to make sure that we're in the back end folder and then we'll type mpx prisma db push if we expand this a bit what this will do is it will take our model and it will automatically go and create the tables in our database as you can see it's reading the environment variables to get our database connection string and it's pulling in the schema from our schema.prisma file and then it says your database is now in sync with your prisma schema which is good and it's also generated a prisma client the prisma client is what we use in our code to interact with our database table and it gives us a, a nice way to do that without having to write loads of sql statements search ourselves and things like that well now that we have a database which has some tables in it we can create the favorites endpoint in our node backend which the ui will call and then we'll save the favorite to the database we'll go to index.ts this is where our endpoints are in our backend source folder and just below our existing endpoints we'll take a new line and then we'll say app.post because we're creating something from the ui or creating a new favorite it will be a post and the url will be similar to the others we'll say slash api slash recipes slash favorite and then we'll pass in our async function and we'll add our request and response parameters in here whenever this endpoint gets called it's going to have a recipe id in the request body we need to get this by saying const recipe id is equal to request dot body dot recipe id once we have this we can add a try catch statement in here in here what we will do is we will use the prisma client to save the new recipe id to our database first we need to import prisma client we'll scroll to the top and just below our code to create a new app we'll say const prisma client is equal to new prisma client and we have to import it we'll say import open braces prisma client and then outside the braces we'll say from open our quotes at prisma slash client this prisma client gets generated whenever we run the command to sync the database and now we can use this in our endpoint we'll scroll back down to our app.post code and then in the try what we'll do is we'll say const favorite recipe going to do a wait prisma client dot and then if we type f you can see that intel that intellisense has given us the name of the model that we created in our schema.prisma file the favorite recipes table we can perform a bunch of operations on it like here what we want to do is say dot create and then we'll open our braces and inside here we'll we'll add an object when we use prisma to create rows in our database we have to tell it the data we'll say data colon and then open braces and if we do control space or command space you can see that intellisense has picked up the two columns in our table the id is going to get auto generated for us so we don't need to add this in here all we have to do is add the recipe id the recipe id that we want to save comes from the request body we'll paste this in like this and at the end of our try block we will say return res.status 
open braces and then we'll say 201. So the 201 status means created successfully. And then we'll just return the recipe that was created by Prisma back to the front end. And if we get any errors, what we'll do is we'll console log the error. We can see what happened. And then we'll return res.status. And we'll say 500, which means something went wrong on our backend. And I will say JSON, and I will just return a generic error message, which says error. Oops, something went wrong. We don't want to return the error back to the front end because this could contain a lot of sensitive information, such as IDs and table structures and things that could be used to perform SQL attacks and all sorts of scary stuff like that. We'll just send back a, a generic error message and on our server, we'll still be able to see the log ourself to help with debugging. Okay, now we have our new endpoint and we're saving the favorite to our database. We can test this endpoint using Thunder Client or Postman. We can't use the browser for this one because the browser doesn't let us do post requests too easily. If you go into your client, create a new request, and then we'll change the method here to post. And then it's going to be for the URL, we'll do HTTP localhost 5000 slash API slash recipes slash favorite. And in the little tabs just below here, we have to add the body this time. Since we're making a push request, it has a body. What we're going to do is just hard code a recipe ID just to make sure that our endpoint and our database is working correctly. So in here, we'll open some braces and we'll add quotes because this is JSON. We'll say recipe ID and the value for this will be an ID for a given recipe. So the best way to get one to make sure that the data is correct is to have a look at our search endpoint again and we'll just take the first one or the first recipe that comes back in the result we'll just take that id we'll jump back to the code and we'll paste this in here as a number so now if we try this if we expand you can see we've got our favorite recipe it was just created in the response it's got an id of two and it saved the recipe id it looks like things have worked. What we'll do is we'll jump into the browser here where we've created our database. And if you go to Elephant SQL and select the database that you created, on the left hand side, you can see there's a browser button here. If we click this, it brings up a thing that we can use to query the database. If you click on table queries and select favorite recipes, you can see it has one row. This looks like it's all good. So if we click execute, you can see that we have one row and it's our recipe that we just created. While we're here, we'll add the endpoint that will get the list of recipes and return those recipes back to the UI. We'll jump back into the code and we'll go back into index.ts and just below where we created the post endpoint we'll add a few new lines and then here we'll say app.get open our braces and open our quotes and then this is going to be the same endpoint as what we did with the post we can go ahead and copy this and because it's a get and we'll add our async function and we'll add our request and response parameters inside our function what we want to do is add a try catch and what we can do here is say const recipes it's going to be equal to await prisma client dot favorite recipes dot find many what this will do is it will go to our database and it will go to the favorite recipes table and it's going to find all the rows in that table and it's going to return it and assign it to the recipes variable. 
before we return this variable containing uh, the list of favorite IDs back to the UI, what we want to do is we want to call our recipe website API and get the detail for that recipe because currently we only have the ID. But what we want is we want the we want the response from our endpoint to be similar to what we had with the search. We want to have an ID, a title, and an image type. So the reason we want this is because we want our API to be consistent. And it just means that there's less work for us to do on the UI. We need to have a look at the documentation. We'll go to the recipe website documentation. And if we have a look down the left, you can see we've got this endpoint called get recipe information bulk. This is good because it lets us get information about multiple recipes at once. And if we have a look at the endpoint, it's a get request. And if we have a look at the parameters, you can see it accepts an ID or an IDs parameter. And this is just a com comma separated list of recipe IDs. Our database will have this information. You just need to convert it into query parameters and send the IDs of the recipes that we want to get the full information for to this endpoint. We'll jump back into our code. And what we want to do in here is take a new line and we just need to change the shape of our data a bit. We'll do const recipe IDs. It's going to equal to recipes.map. And then in here, we'll add our function, which takes the recipe that the map function is currently on. And then we'll just return recipe dot recipe ID to string. All this is doing is iterating over our list of favorite recipes and selecting the recipe ID, and then it's converting it to a string. When this is done, we'll have an array of recipe ID strings, and this, it'll be stored in a variable called recipe IDs. So now that we have these IDs, we need to call the recipe website endpoint and pass these IDs to it. Just like before, we're going to add all the logic to call the recipe API to the recipe API file. This just keeps our code organized. We'll open up the Explorer. We're going to backend source recipe API.ts. And in here, we'll just go to the bottom and then we'll create a new function called favorite recipes by IDs. And then this will so be an async arrow function. And for the parameters, we want to accept the IDs. And this is going to be a string array. So this will be what we just created using our map function. And then just like before, we'll create a URL. We'll say const URL equals new. Open our braces. And here we'll say https slash API dot com slash recipes slash information bulk just like this and we'll add our query params say params equals and that's, it'll be an object and then in here we'll add our api key and then we'll add our ids so we'll say ids colon and then this will be ids which we are passing in dot join this will join all the elements in the array and then we'll pass in some quotes and then pass in a comma. This is just going to convert our array into a string and all the elements will be separated by a comma. This is the structure that the API, that the recipe API endpoint is looking for. As you can see here, we've got an example that they've given us. At the end here, they've told us to append the IDs in a comma separated way. This is what we're aiming for. Once we've created our parameters, we'll add them to the URL, say url.search equals new URL search params, open our braces and pass in the params and then say to string. This is probably complaining about the 
API key again, yep. If we scroll up, just like any other functions, what we'll do is copy the code that checks if we have an API key, and then we'll throw an error if we don't. We'll copy this, scroll back down to our get favorite recipes by IDs, and at the top, we'll paste it in. That should get rid of their error. Once we've added our parameters, we can make the fetch request, say const search. Response is equal to await fetch, and then we'll pass in the URL, and then we'll convert this to JSON. Say const JSON equals await search response dot JSON, and then at the end we'll just return this. We'll return the JSON. After we've done that, we can do return, and then we want to add an object in here this time, and then we'll add the results to a results properties. This just means that the API response from our favorites endpoints will match the rest uh, of the endpoints that we've created. And once we've done that, we can scroll up and export our get favorite recipes function and hit save. Now if we go back to index.ts and into our endpoint, take a new line underneath our map function and we can say const favorites is equal to await and then we'll say recipe api dot get favorite recipes by ids open our braces and then we'll pass in our recipe ids if something um, has gone wrong here uh, typescript would have told us this is good everything seems to be, everything seems to be working okay and we have no errors. So now that we've got our IDs and we've called the recipe API to get the detail for each recipe in our recipe IDs array, we can return this back to the front end. So say return res.json and then we'll pass in the favorites. <coughs> okay, so now we can try this request. If we go into the request tab, We'll do a get this time to the same endpoint. We should have one item be returned in the response because we have saved a favorite recipe already. If we do a get, we got a 200 response, which is good. And we have a results array. And then in here, we have one result. Since they're different APIs, the responses aren't exactly the same as we've got all this extra stuff. But if we scroll down th through it, you can see we've got the ID, the title, the image, and the image type. This means that even though there's extra properties here, that this response will still work with our existing code types and components on the UI as it has the same properties as our search request. But that means we don't have to create new recipe cards just for the favorites and we can reuse everything we have already. We'll see this when we come to do the UI parts. Before we jump back into the UI, what we'll do is create the endpoint to delete the favorite. So if we go into index.ts, we'll create our final endpoint just below the get favorites endpoint. So here we'll type app.delete as it's going to be a delete method. Open our braces and then the endpoint is going to be the same as the others. So we can copy it and paste it in. Then we'll add our async arrow function as usual, and then we'll add the request and add the response variables. From here, all we need to do is delete, add the record from the database. To delete a recipe, we need to know what the recipe ID is. So we'll say const recipe ID is going to be equal to ID. Similar to our post, we're going to send a recipe ID in the body. And then we'll do a try catch and inside our try we're going to do a wit prisma dot favorite recipes dot delete open our braces for delete we need to do a where clause we'll say where and then we'll say colon open our braces and then if we do control space again you can see it's given us some options we'll say recipe id add a colon and then we'll say recipe ID. So this will look for 
a row in our table which has the recipe ID of the one that we get from the body of our delete request and then it's going to remove it and then if all goes well we can return response.status of 204 204 means no content and it implies that something was deleted and then we'll just do send and we want our catch block to be the same as our previous functions we'll scroll up to the post and then we'll copy everything inside the catch block and we'll scroll down and we'll paste it into the catch block of our delete and just make sure that we add this to the catch block of our get Favorites as well, as it looked like we forgot to do that. Let's paste it in like that. And that should be it. Now we can go to our request, and this time we'll just change it to a delete. And we're hoping to see the status change to 204. If we click and and we're sending the recipe ID in the body of the one that we added to the database when we tested our post request. If we click send, we get 204 no content. And what we can do now is we can check the database. And if we do a select, there should be no rows because we deleted it. Yeah, there's no rows. Okay, now that we have our endpoints in place that allow us to add favorite recipes to the database, what we'll do is we'll add the favorites functionality to the front end. But if we look at the finished example, you can see in our favorites tab if we click on it then the ui updates to display the recipe cards of our favorite recipes the first thing we'll do is we'll add the functionality for the tabs into our app and then we'll add the logic to fetch the favorite recipes when the app loads we'll jump back into our code and we're in front end source app.tsx and because we need to know what tab the user has selected I'm going to store this in state just below the existing state objects what I'm going to do is say const open square braces and then we'll say selected tab and we'll say this will be equal to use state and then we'll open and close our brackets in here what we can do is create a new type to ensure that selected tab can be one of two values either search or favorites because we have a search tab or a favorites tab just above our app function we'll take a few lines and then we'll say type we'll use the type keyword to specify the type this time we'll say type tabs it's going to be equal to search or favorites and those values will be strings and then what we can do is Use this type back in our use state hook that we just created. Just before the braces, we'll add angle brackets and then we'll say tabs. This is helpful as it means that selected tab can only ever be search or favorites. If we try to initialize this to something else, let's say hello, it's going to give us an error that says argument of type hello is not assignable to parameter of type tabs if we set this to search the error disappears this is helpful as it catches bugs early if we misspell search for example then it'll tell us it also means any developers coming in after us know that even though select a tab is a string it can only be one of two values and that's search or favorites and if we decided to add more tabs in here we could update the type and it would take effect down here as well. So that's just an extra benefit of using TypeScript. Now we know what the selected tab is. We can add the markup for the tabs and add the logic to change a tab. So we'll scroll down to our JSX and just inside the top level div here and above the form, we'll take a new line and then we'll add a, um, a div and this will have a class name of tabs. And in here, what we'll do is say H1, and this tab will be recipe search. And we'll add a second tab for our 
favorites. We'll say favorites in here. Now what we want to do is we want to add an on-click event to these headings and say the first part of the tag will say on click it's going to be equal to an arrow function and then we're going to set selected tab to be search and for the favorites tab we'll do similar we'll say on click it's going to be equal to an arrow function and we'll set selected tab to be favorites okay now what we want to do is conditionally render either the search results or the favorites based on our selected tab just outside of uh, the tabs div that we added here we're going to open up our angle braces and in here we'll add some conditional logic we'll say selected tab equals and then we'll open our speech marks and then We'll say search then we'll say double ampersand and then we'll open our braces so now what we want to do is we want to cut and paste the existing code that we have to display the search and the search to display the search form and the search results recipe cards and paste it in here the easiest way to do this is just to close our form tag and scroll down a bit and we just want to highlight everything from the bottom of the button and highlight the map stuff that displays the recipe cards and highlight the form so then we'll cut this using Control x or whatever you prefer and then inside our braces that we opened inside our conditional logic here we'll add a react fragment and then we'll take a few new lines and then just paste in the code that we cut and if you save it should auto format for you all we've done is said only display our search form and our search results and our button if the selected tab is search so now we'll scroll just below this if you want you can close this on the left hand side to make it easier to see and then we'll take a new line then we'll do similar for the favorites tab so we can say selected tab is equal to favorites and then we'll do double ampersand again open our braces and then in here we'll just add a div and we'll just add some text so we'll say this is the favorites and we'll go into and we'll add some styles just to make it a bit clear on the UI how things um, should look. We'll go into our explorer and then into app.css. We don't have to add too much in here. If you've copied the CSS from Code Coyotes, then you've probably got this already. If you haven't, then we'll just type dot tabs. This is the class name that we give our div that wraps our tab buttons and say display flex. Then we'll just add a gap and we'll say to em whenever we say display flex this defaults to having all our elements align horizontally and then a gap just add some spacing uh, of to em and finally we'll add cursor pointer this just means whenever we hover over the tab heading that it's going to change to a pointer and just tells the user that this is clickable if we save this and if we open up the browser you can see we have two titles appear here if we click on favorites it's going to hide the search recipe panel and it's going to do to display our text that we added to the favorites panel and if we click back to recipe search and it's going to show our search term so we'll just make sure we haven't broken anything else by trying the search out if we click burgers we get the list of burgers back and if we click on burger and it loads our modal which is good and we'll just test the view more as well and that seems to be working as well okay that's good okay next what we can do now that we have somewhere to display the favorites is we can fetch the favorites from our back end and display them what we're going to do is we're going to 
fetch the favorites and store them in state in the top level of our app. The reason we're doing this is because quite a lot of things on our app relies on the favorites. For example, even though we have uh, the favorites tab, which displays favorite recipes, if we go to the search, we also want to display if any of the search results are in our favorites already. It's a good idea to store your state at the higher level if you have a lot of components that rely on the state. If we jump back into the code then, and we'll go into app.tsx, and we'll scroll to the top, and just after our state hooks and our page number stuff, we'll take a few new lines, and since we want to fetch the data when the app loads, we're going to use the use effect hook. So we'll say use effect, open our braces, and then we'll pass in an arrow function. And then in here, we'll say const fetch favorite recipes be equal to an async arrow function. And then in here, we'll add a try catch that we can make an API request and then catch the errors and do whatever we want with it. So in the try, we'll say const favorite recipes is going to be equal to api dot get favorite recipes and then in the catch block we'll log the error okay and just outside of the function what we'll do is we'll call it by saying fetch favorite recipes and open in our braces and then we'll add our dependency array just outside the last curly brace here we want to do a comma and then we'll add an empty array anytime we're fetching data if we want to make sure that the data only fetches on first load then we add an empty dependency array so it means when our app re-renders due to other state variables changing it means that we're not constantly going and fetching the data at that point okay let's import the use effect hook if you click on it and click on the light bulb it'll give you a helper you can import it and now we just need to write the front end logic to call our back end api if you remember back we have a api class or file that we had separated out from our components to handle all the api call logic if we jump into that if we go into the file explorer and if you go to front end source api.ts you can see we have a few functions in here already our search recipes and our get recipe summary at the bottom of the file we'll add a new one and then we'll call this const get favorite recipes and this will be equal to an async function and then we'll open our braces we don't need to pass any parameters in here because we're just getting everything from the api as it is and in here we'll say const url is equal to new url open our braces and then we'll say http colon slash localhost colon 5000 slash api slash recipe slash favorite and then if we take a new line we don't have to add anything else to this. We can go ahead and do the fetch request. We'll say const response is equal to wait fetch open braces and we'll pass in our URL. And if we scroll up, you can see we've done some basic checks in here. You can copy this. If the response is not okay, then we're going to throw a new error that says whatever the problem is and then it will get caught in the catch block from the calling function. The last thing we have to do is just return response.json. And we'll add the await keyword in here as well. And lastly, we'll export functions that we can call it from app.tsx. So that looks good. We'll jump back into app.tsx now and scroll down to our use effect hook and the error's gone that we had before. So now when the app runs it's going to 
fetch the recipes from the API and assign to the favorite recipes. Before we can display the favorite recipes, we need to store them in state so that we can access it. So we'll scroll to the top and just beneath the state hook that we created for the tab, we'll create a new one for favorite recipes. We'll say const open square brackets, favorite recipes, comma, set favorite recipes. And this is going to be equal to use state. And we'll open our angle brackets. And this will be of type recipe array. And then we'll initialize this to be an empty array. This is why we tried to keep the shape of our API responses um, similar because even though our favorite recipes and our recipes from the search results come from different endpoints, we can still use the same type on the front end, which makes our life a lot easier as we haven't had to write any additional code or separate code for the favorite recipes. So now we have our state hook. We can scroll down to use effect and we'll call the set favorite recipes function and pass in our favorite recipes. Now that we have this, what we can do is scroll down to our JSX and we're going to delete the text that we added for testing and we'll take a few lines inside the div and then we'll open our braces and then in here we'll do favorite recipes map and then we'll say recipe single dot map and then we'll pass in our arrow function and we'll add the parameter that we get which is uh, the recipe that the map function is currently on and then in here what we want to do is render the react card component that we added earlier and since the types are the same, we can pass in the recipe and we can also pass in our on click event so that whenever this recipe card is clicked, that it sets the selected recipe to be the recipe. Whenever we set selected recipe, it's going to display the modal that shows the recipe summary and that modal will go off and get the summary data from the API. We want the modal to behave the same, even though we're using it in a different place. And because we've managed to keep the types the same, it should all work similar. Now that we've got this in place, we can go back to the browser. And if we click on favorites, it's not going to show anything yet because we haven't added any favorites. We deleted it when we were testing our delete endpoint. There's two things we can do here at this point. We can go into the database uh, and add um, a row there, or we can just call our add favorite recipe endpoint that we created earlier from a Thunder client. We'll do that. If we jump back into the code and then we'll go into Thunder client. If you have an existing recipe, then you don't need to do this. Thunder client's good at storing your past requests as well. So if we click on this post one, you can see it's going to do a post request to localhost 5000 API slash recipe slash favorites. And then in the body, we should hopefully have an ID and, and we do. If we hit send on this, we get 201 created, which is good. Now we have a recipe favorite in our database. If we jump back to the browser, if we refresh this and click on favorites, it still doesn't work. Okay, so let's have a look. If we open our dev tools and we'll see if there's any errors in here. Our console saying that the server responded with a status of 404 not found and it's telling us where. This is why we log things in the catch because it helps us identify problems. If we look at the network as well, and if we try this again, if we go to favorites, it's saying cannot get recipe slash favorite. That's because our endpoint URL is API slash recipes with an S. We've just had a spell mistake in there. If we go back to our code and we go into front end source api.ts and get favorite recipes change this recipe to recipes and that looks good so if we save this 
and refresh this and hit favorites and it's still not working let's have a look again let's see what happened this time if we look at the console it's saying favorite recipes dot map is not a function which probably means we've saved the wrong thing into state but we'll check the network tab first just to make sure that the api calls happen this time and it is we are getting the favorites back and it does have one result which is the favorite we just added to the database that's good and i think what's happened is if we look at our code in the use effect hook whenever we fetch the favorites instead of placing the whole response back into state what we need to do is say favorite recipes dot results because that contains the array that has our favorite recipes in it so we'll try this again hopefully third time lucky refresh api calls given us 200 back this is good and if we click favorites we finally see something we've got our burger that we save to the database okay so now we can display favorites we'll add functionality to save a favorite but if we look at our final example here after we search for the term we get a list back and we have these little heart icons and if we click we'll save it to our favorites we just added chicken ranch burgers and if we go into favorites we can see chicken ranch burgers is in here too we'll add this functionality next we'll jump back into the code the first thing we'll do is add the little heart icon. We'll open up um, a terminal and then we'll make sure we're in the front end directory. And then we'll do npm i react icons. This is a popular icon package that we're going to use. And make sure to start your front end server again. And you can close down the terminal. And to add the little heart icon, we'll jump into the recipe card component and just up above the h3 inside the recipe card title we'll take a new line and then we'll add a span inside the span we're going to use ai outline this comes from the package we just installed we'll scroll to the top and then we'll do import ai outline heart from and then open speech marks and we'll do react icons slash ai this is just the package that has the heart icon and back down in our heart component we'll change the size to be 25 as the default is quite small so now if we have a look at this in the browser just to make sure things appeared before we carry on we search we've got We've got the heart appearing. We'll just quickly add some styles that it appears on the same line. We'll jump back into app.css and just after the tabs, we'll say recipe card title. And then we'll just use text box to make sure that everything stacks horizontally. And then we'll say align items flex. And then we'll add a gap, 0.5. Let's see what this looks like. Doesn't look too much better. I think we can remove the flex end. Instead, use align items center. This should center everything vertically. If we have a look at the browser, and it does. Now we have this little heart. What we want to happen is whenever we click this heart, that it's going to call our save favorite recipe endpoint on our back end. For that, we need an event handler and some code to handle the API logic. Add the event handler and we'll add it to app.tsx, which is the top level. The reason we're adding it here is because it keeps all our event handlers together and it makes it easier to update the favorite recipes state variable once the API call has completed. In app.tsx, you want to create a new function it doesn't matter too much where you put it just as long as it's at the top inside the app component we'll say const favorite recipe and this will be equal to an async function and we'll open our braces before we can add the favorite recipe to our backend we 
we need to know what recipe the user intends to save. We'll pass this in as a parameter. We'll say recipe, and this will be of type recipe. Now in here, we'll add our try catch block, and then we'll do await API dot add favorite recipe. Open our braces, and then we'll pass in our recipe. And then we'll just do console log our error like this. Our await function, we don't need to assign anything to a, um, a variable here because all we need to know is that the API call was a success. And if it was a success, then we'll save it to state. Before we save it to state, we need to the function that calls the backend API. We'll go into .ts in our front end source folder. And just below to get favorite recipes, we'll do export const add favorite recipe. And this will be equal to an async arrow function. And this will accept uh, the recipe. We'll say recipe colon, and then we'll add the type for recipe like this. And then we'll create the URL in a similar way. We can actually scroll up and copy this line as it's going to be uh, the same endpoint. We'll paste it in like this. And since we're creating a recipe, we'll be sending a body. So we'll say const body is equal to uh, an object. And our API requires the recipe ID. So we'll say the recipe ID colon, and then we can get the ID from the recipe object that was passed in up here. We'll say recipe dot ID, and IntelliSense has helped us here. Okay, we have our URL and our body. Now we can pass this to the fetch function and make the request. We'll say const response is equal to await fetch, open our braces, and then we'll pass in the URL. But this time, since we're doing a post, we need to tell fetch that we want to do a post request. After URL, we'll add a comma, and then we'll add our braces. This is an object containing all the options that we want to send to the API. Say method, colon, and then open our speech marks. And it's going to be a post. And then we'll do a comma, and then we'll say headers. And this will be an object. And inside the headers object, we want to say content dash colon. It's going to be application slash JSON. This just tells the server what type of data to expect in the body. And just like say the headers object, we'll do a comma, and then we'll pass in our body. We'll say body colon, and then we'll say json.stringify, and then we'll pass in the body. We need to convert the body object to a string before we can add it to the request. And we'll scroll up to one of our other functions, and then we'll copy the error handling code. We'll scroll down, and just after the fetch request, we'll add a few new lines, and we'll paste this in. Now we don't have to return anything from this function, because we'll just assume that if the response didn't throw an error, that our API call was good, and that it saved to the database. Now if we jump back into app.tsx, Back into your add favorite recipe function. We have this line. If we didn't get an error, then that means that the catch block won't run. All went well. And now what we can do is we'll add the new favorite recipe to state. We'll call set favorite recipe and then we'll pass in an array. And then we will do the three dots to copy the existing favorite recipes array. Then we'll do a comma, and then we'll pass in the recipe that we want to add to the favorite. We're persisting it to the back end here, and then we're updating the UI here. So now we have our handler function. We just need to attach it to the little heart icon that we added earlier. So if we scroll down to our JSX, what we want to do is we want to pass this event handler to the recipe card because the little heart icon is within the recipe card. 
will add a new prop that says on favorite button click and then this will be equal to our add favorite recipe event handler it's giving us an error because we haven't added on favorite button click to the prop types of recipe card we'll do this now if we go into recipe card scroll up to the top and then we'll add it in here we'll say on favorite button click it's going to be equal to a function and this function will accept the recipe and it'll be of type recipe now in our recipe card we can destructure on favorite button click like this in our props and then if we scroll down to our jsx we added a span we'll add the on click to this and we'll say on click and then we're going to pass in an arrow function and the on click will pass the event to our function and what we need to do in here is say event dot stop propagation what this means is because we have nested on click events we have an on click event on the parent recipe card div as well is that when we click this specific element that it's going to ignore the on click on the recipe card and it's going to fire whatever logic we decide in here and what we want to do is call on favorite button click and pass in this recipe now if we look at app.tsx and we'll check for error. So the recipe card component in our favorites tab is complaining because we haven't added the on favorite button click function. What we'll do is we'll add it just like this. This will behave a bit differently. If we look at our finished example on the favorites tab, what we want to happen whenever we click the heart button on a recipe card in the favorites tab is that it gets removed. We haven't added the functionality to remove a favorite yet, which we'll do next. Just for now, if we jump into our code and for the recipe card that gets rendered in the favorites tab, we're just going to pass in an empty function. It doesn't do anything. Whenever we come to add the remove favorite logic, we'll come back to this. But for now, we're focused on the add favorite logic. This looks to be all the errors fixed. If we jump back to our code again and if we go to the recipe search tab if we look at our favorites first actually we have loaded turkey burgers saved in here now if we go to the search tab and then we'll add the chicken ranch burgers if we click this nothing will happen here yet but if we go to the favorites tab you can see that it's appeared and if we refresh the browser and go to favorites you can see it displays here as well this means we're successfully persisting the favorites to our database and we're also updating the state on the ui at the point when the user clicks the heart next we'll add the functionality that changes the heart to be read if this recipe is contained in the favorites if you look at the finished example in our favorites we have two burgers and if those burgers appear in our search results then they get a little heart as well we'll jump back to our code again and scroll down to our recipes search results this is everything inside the search tab it'll be in around line 84 if you're following and what we want to do here as is check that for each recipe that we're displaying we want to check if that recipe exists in our favorite recipes state object to do this we need to add some logic to this function we'll click on the little arrow function here and if you go to the light bulb that appears and um, it says add braces to arrow function we'll click this and it's just refactored uh, things for us so that we can add variables in here this will still work the same and we'll take a new line just above the return statement and then we'll say const is favorite is going to be equal to favorite recipes favorite recipes is our state object which we're storing our favorite recipes in up here and then we want to say dot sum and open our braces and then we'll pass in a arrow function 
and this will give us the recipe that the sum function is currently on. In here, what we're going to do is say if the recipe.id is equal to the fave recipe.id, then it's going to return true. What this function basically does is as we're mapping through at the recipes array, for each recipe, it's going to go and see if that recipe exists in the favorite recipes array. If it does, then it's going to return either true or false to the is favorite variable. So now at this point, we know if the recipe being rendered is a favorite, we can perform logic on it. We'll pass this variable is favorite to our recipe card. We'll say is favorite. Go to equal to is favorite like this. And then we'll jump into recipe card and scroll to the top. And in our props, we'll say is favorite to just to define the new prop. And also we have type boolean, which is a true or false value. Now in our component, we can destructure this. We'll say is favorite. And then we'll scroll down to where we added a uh, little heart before. Now we can add some conditional logic in here. It says is favorite. And we'll add a question mark. And what we want to do is add uh, the solid heart in here. If it's true, say AL heart. Then we'll add a colon. And then we'll cut the heart that we added earlier. We're going to select this component. We're going to cut. And we're going to paste it just after the colon and before the closing brace. And the last thing we need to do is import this. If you click on it, the blue light bulb should appear and it should say update import from React Icons AI. We'll do this. And what we want to do is add the size property to this as well. So it's the same size and we'll say 25. And then we want the color to be red. Okay, now we have a conditional check based on the is favorite property. And if we go back to app that uh, in the recipe card that gets displayed under the favorites tab, it's complaining because we haven't passed is favorite. Because this is the favorites tab, then is favorite is always going to be true. We don't have to perf perform any logic here. We can just add uh, the property like this. The heart will always be red if it's in the favorites panel or in the favorites tab. If we save this, let's have a look at browser to see how things are looking now. Fresh. Have a look at our favorites. There's two favorites. There's the loaded turkey burgers and the chicken ranch burgers. If we search for burgers, hopefully we get those two values back in the API. Now we've got loaded turkey burgers. Now if we scroll down, we should see the other one. And if we scroll down and if we click a new heart, one that isn't favorite, it changes to red. It, it updates because we save the favorites to the back end. And then we add this recipe to the favorite recipes array. If we just look at the code again, but then whenever the favorite recipe array gets updated, it re renders. That means the recipes.map function runs again. And the check for is favorite runs again. And this time the recipe is there because we added it to state, which means is favorite, is favorite will be true. And then the little heart gets turned to red. Then we'll just Check our favorites tab to make sure that they're all appearing and they are and we refresh you can see that we have four favorites now okay the last bit of core functionality that we need to add is the remove favorites we look at the finished app if we have a favorite if we click on it it should indicate that this recipe is no longer a favorite and if we go to the favorites tab it should disappear also, if we're in the favorites tab and we click on the heart here, it should disappear from the favorites tab altogether. To do this will be very similar to how we did the add favorites. We'll add an event handler and then we'll call our delete endpoint that we created earlier. And then we'll just add some conditional logic to determine if we're, if we need to add a favorite or if we need to remove a favorite. We'll jump into our code 
and we'll go to app.tsx and just below the add favorite recipe event handler we'll create one called remove favorite recipe and this will be equal to an async function and just add favorite recipe we need to know the recipe that we're removing so we'll say recipe is going to be a parameter and we'll pass in the recipe and we'll pass in the type of recipe and here we'll add the usual stuff we'll add a try catch and we'll say await api dot remove favorite recipe we'll pass in the recipe this will be the code that calls our api and just below this in the catch block we'll say console dot log error okay so now we need to jump into our api and write the logic to call the delete endpoint we'll go into front end source folder we'll go to api and at the very bottom just below add favorite recipe we're going to create a new function called remove favorite recipe be equal to an async arrow function and again we'll pass in the recipe give it a type of recipe and we'll scroll up and we'll scroll up and we'll copy the url for this and we'll scroll up and we'll copy all the code from the add recipe function as it's going to be very similar we're just going to make one change we can paste it in here we have our url which points to our favorites endpoint and we have our body which is going to send the recipe id which we get from the recipe that was clicked and then we do the fetch request instead of method post it'll be delete and the header is going to be the same and the body is going to be the same as well and if we get a bad response then we're going to throw the error and that'll get caught in our try catch block and if not then we just assume that ev everything went well so the last thing to do is export this we'll say export and then we'll jump back into app.tsx and in our event handler remove favorite recipe once we have persisted the change to our back end by calling the api what we need to do is remove that recipe from the favorites array the way we do is we use the filter array function we'll say const updated recipes is going to be equal to recipes dot filter open our brackets and we'll pass in our arrow function and the filter function is going to pass the current recipe that it's currently on in the loop to our function and then in here we'll say recipe dot id is not equal to the fav recipe dot id and we'll save this what this function will do is it will iterate over the favorite recipes array and it will only return the recipes where recipe id is not equal to the favorite recipe id in other words we're filtering out this recipe that was passed to the function now we've got our updated array we just need to set this into state into state we'll do set favorite recipes and we'll pass in updated recipes like this okay so now we just need to hook this into our heart button we'll scroll down to our where i've added on favorite button click to the recipe card inside the search results we currently have it that every time the heart is clicked it's going to call the add favorite recipe function but what we want to happen is we'll just jump back to the browser for a second what we want to happen is if we click on the favorite button if it's not currently a favorite then we want to set it to a favorite and if we click on it when it is a favorite we want to set it to be an unfavorite in other words we're either adding or deleting we need to add some conditional logic in here to call either the add favorite event handler or the remove favorite event handler depending on the current state of this button we'll jump into our code and we can do this a few ways but since we 
already have the is favorite variable, which we're using here, we can use this to determine what function to pass to our component that gets called when the favorite button is, is clicked. So instead of just passing add favorite button in here, we can say is favorite and add a question mark. And then if his favorite is true, we'll say use the add favorite recipe function. And then after this, we'll add a colon. And then we'll say remove favorite recipe. But because we've done this logic here, before we pass it to the component, we don't need to change anything in our recipe card. And now we'll scroll down to the recipe card in the favorites panels. If you remember back, we added a empty function to our on favorite button click. But since we're in the favorites tab, we know that we want to remove the favorite recipe from here. So again, just like passing as favorite is true, we can just pass in the remove favorite recipe function. It's always going to call. Now let's have a look at the browser and we'll do our search for burgers just to make sure that we get uh, some of our favorites back. We have a couple of favorites here. If we click one of these, it looks like it doesn't work. So let's have a look. Getting some errors here. Our post is returning 500 bad requests. Let's have a look in, in our code and see what happened. If we scroll up in the Prisma logs, it looks like we're getting an error around the create. It looks like it's calling the wrong endpoint. Let's have a look at that code. And here we've said on favorite button click. And yeah, we just put these backwards. If it is a favorite, what we want to do is call the remove favorite recipe and not the add. We just got these two mixed up. If we swap them around, and we're saying if on favorite button click is a favorite, then we want to remove it. If it's not a favorite, then we want to add it. Let's save this and try it again. Let's close down all these scary errors and then we'll refresh. Search for burgers again. If we click on one of these, we'll just click the top one and it's removed. Let's see if it's gone from the favorites. We removed the loaded turkey burgers and yep, it's, it's gone. Let's see if we can remove the favorites from here. Anytime we click one, it gets removed. And if we go back to the recipe search, let's add it again just to make sure. It looks like it's added. We'll check our favorites tab and it's been added to the bottom. Okay, so that's the bulk of the functionality in. So now we know um, how we want things to look. We'll go and we'll style some of these things. So that it looks a bit more like our finished example here. We're going to add an image to the top with this overlay with a title. And then we're going to style up our cards and display them in a grid that if we collapse the window, we can see the cards resize. And if we get to a small screen, we eventually have um, a nice single column. And if we scroll up, you can see the whole app is responsive. And we'll scroll down and we'll have our three more button at the bottom. And we'll have the same effect uh, on the favorites tab. We can add a couple of favorites now and then go to the favorites tab and it'll work the same. Okay, to start styling this, we're going to start at the top and work our way down. We'll add this image with the title in the middle and the overlay on the background of the image. The first thing we need to do is get an image. If we jump into our code in the Explorer, if we go to the front end folder, you'll notice we have a public folder. This is where we can put static assets that our front end uses. To get an image, you can either get it from the starter code over at Code Coyotes, or you can go to somewhere like Pexels.com and then just search for food or something. Just make sure that you get an image that is horizontal, just to make it a bit easier when we're dealing with the aspect ratios and things like that. So once you have your image, go back to the code and add it to public folder. And if you click on it, it should give you a preview um, in Visual Studio. We'll go to app.tsx and we'll go into our ASX 
markup. And the first thing we'll do is we'll add a class name to the very top div. So we'll say class name is going to be equal to app container. This will help us with the spacing of each of our elements on the page. And within here and within the app container div, we're going to add a new div with a class name of header. This will hold our image and our title in the header div. We'll add an image and then we'll say the source is going to be equal to slash hero image jpeg and then we'll close the image tag just make sure whatever you call the image in the public folder is the same as this and include the file extension and just make sure you have a slash at the front as well so just beneath this image tag we're going to add a div with a class name of title and then you can put whatever you want in here I'll just say my recipe app like this. Now, if we go into app.css and we'll scroll to the top in here, what we're going to do is we'll add a, a styling for our app container. We want to say display flex and then flex direction column. And then we'll add a gap of 2 em. Next, we'll add the header. Styles, we need to say position relative in here. And after this, we can style our image. We can say header image. This will select the image tag within the header class. And then we'll say the width is going to be 100% because we always want it to take up 100% of the space available. And height will say 500 pixels which is just a C in default that will cover all um, our use cases. Then we'll say object fit cover and object position center. So this will crop the image while you're keeping the aspect ratio, depending on the size of the screen. Then we want to say opacity is going to be 50% just to make it a bit transparent. And then we'll say border radius will be one EM. And Next, we'll style our title. We'll say dot title. Open our braces. And in here, we're going to say position absolute. Position absolute means that it doesn't follow the flow of other DOM elements. And instead, it positions itself based on the closest element that has position relative. This is our header. We'll say top 50%, left 50%, transform, translate, minus 50%, comma, minus 50%. This just helps center everything within its parent. Now we'll say we want the text color to be white, we want the font size to be 2EM, and we'll say text line center. And we want the background color to be black. And we'll set the opacity to be around 80%. This just makes it a bit transparent so we can see through it. And then we just add some padding. We'll say 1.5 EM space 1.5 EM space not 0.5 1.5 EM. This is shorthand for saying top right bottom and left instead of saying padding right padding left and so on we can do it this way and if we save this and if we jump back to our app in the browser you can see uh, our image has appeared at the top and um, it has some text within it and if we change the window size you can see everything is quite responsive now we'll add uh, some spacing to the entire app just to make it just that it's not sitting uh, close to the edge of the browser window. We'll jump back into the code and we'll just scroll to the top. And just after the root class, we'll add some style to the body. And here we'll say we want padding to be 5 EM and we'll padding bottom to be 5 and we want the height to be 100% of the 
viewport height and then background color can be anything you want it doesn't really matter you can add an rgb value or you can just select this color here if we look at this you can see that we've added padding to the top and padding to the bottom which you which is um, a bit hard to tell but it is there and we haven't added anything to the left or right that's because on mobile screens we don't want any padding to the left or right or current styles are fine for mobile but on larger screens we do want some spacing so what we'll do is we'll add a media query we'll jump back into our code and then we'll say at media and we'll open brackets and then we'll say min dash width colon seven six eight pixels this means for views that are an, a minimum of 768 pixels it's going to apply these styles so what we'll say in here is body and it will add um, a margin to the left of 10 em and add a margin to the right of 10 em as well if we try this in the browser you see we have some nice spacing um, on our bigger screen and if we change the window size at a certain point you can see add uh, the, the margins disappear and it just looks a bit better on the mobile screens okay next we'll style our tabs if we look at the tabs it's not too far away but we do have this little border that appears beneath depending on what the active tab is if you if you remember back our tabs are h1 elements what we want to do is apply an active class based on the tab that we're currently on we're handling all this in in the javascript in the components that's where we'll add um, our class if we jump back into the code we're going to app.css and we will create a a tab active class what this will do is it will add the border it's that orange color that we've seen we'll say orange or so we'll say border bottom and then we'll do about four pixels and then we'll add the colors you can add whichever color you like in here again doesn't matter too much and then we'll say solid this will add a solid border to the bottom of whatever element has this tab active class and then we'll just add some padding so that there's a bit of a space between the text and the border the text and the border say adding bottom 0.5 em okay now we have to go back into app.tsx and then what we can do in our h1 tags here is add a class name like this but instead of a string what we're going to do is open our braces and then in here we'll say if the selected tab is equal to favorites then we want to add the string tab active to the class and if not then we'll just do nothing and add an empty string if we click on the the search tab and this should be search actually not favorite if we click on the search tab it'll set the selected tab to be search it'll see that the selected tab is equal to search and then it'll apply our tab active css class to this elements we can do the same to our favorites tab if we go into our h1 tag or favorites tab as well we just want to do similar and this time we're checking if the selected tab is equal to favorites like this this is an example of how to dynamically apply css using javascript and if we jump back to the browser you can see that if i click on the different tabs the tab active class is getting applied and it's adding our little border okay, so next we'll style the input form here if we look at our finished example in the recipe search tab we're going to have this input and on the right it's going to have uh, the search button in the form of a little icon we'll look at how to do this we'll go back into app.tsx and we'll scroll down to the form which is in the search tabs in and around line 100 depending on your ide setup 
and in, in the button, instead of the text submit, what we're going to have is um, an icon, say AI, outline, search. And then we can import this. This is coming from our React icons package that we imported earlier. And then we'll set the size to be around 40. Now we have an icon and because it's in a button, if we click it, it'll submit the form. If we have a look at the browser just to make sure it appeared, it's appeared here. Now we just need to style up the input and the button. It looks like these two are a single input. We'll go to app.css and we'll add some styles to the form. Since the form wraps the input and the button, it makes sense to do it in here. Just say form and open our braces. It doesn't matter too much where you put these classes because they're all separate anyway. Just add them wherever you're closest. For the form, we want to say display flex. And then we'll add a background color, white. And then we'll say align items center. This should hopefully add a white background. As you can see here, it has. And it's taken up the available width, which is why we used flex. Now we want to jump back into the code and just below the form, we'll style the input. What we want to do is say padding 0.5 EM and we'll make the font size a bit bigger. We'll say 2 EM and then we'll say flex 1 as we want the input to take up all the available space. And then we'll say border. This removes the border and it looks like it's merged with the white background of the form. And we'll style the focus as well. Say input colon focus. This is when we click on the input and we'll say outline is none. And next we'll style our button. We'll say button. We'll add background color to be white, border to be none, and then cursor pointer. This is to indicate that the user can click on it. If we have a look at it now, you can see that all the styles have applied and we have our search input. Next, we'll look at the CSS grid for the recipe cards. If we type burgers, we have our recipe cards, but what we'll do is we'll use a CSS grid to make sure that the images appear in a grid. I'll jump to our finished example here. Yes, our images appear in a grid. So we'll jump into the code and just below our form, and just above where we're displaying the recipe cards, we will add a div in here. And then we'll say class name of recipe. And now what we want to do is cut and paste everything from the recipes map function, including the markup for the recipe card and paste it inside this div. Easiest way to do this is just to close the stuff that we're going to cut and paste beside recipes.map. We're going to close this and we'll just copy everything and we'll paste it in. And while we're here, we'll do the same for the favorites tab because we want the search tab and the favorites tab both to look similar. We'll scroll down to the logic that displays the favorites tab. And it looks like we added a div earlier that wraps the favorites recipe cards rendering logic. All we have to do say class name is equal to recipe grid. Now we'll jump into app.css and then we'll add our recipe grid styles and we'll say display grid and now we'll say grid template columns and then we'll say repeat open our braces and then we'll say auto fill comma, min, max, open braces, and we'll type 400x, comma, 1fr. This might seem like a confusing bit of code, but it's really useful. It's going to add as many columns as it can fit within the parent, and it's going to resize the images 
between 400 pixels and all the available space depending on how much space there is. It sounds pretty confusing, but the good news is anytime you need to have a responsive image grid that you can safely use this. And if you have to change the amount that you want to display per row, you just need to change this value. If we save this, we'll see it working. We'll jump into our app. And as you can see now, we've got the recipe cards displaying in a grid. And if we change the size, you can see it's changing how many columns we have based on the screen size. That's the min max function doing its thing. And if we go to the very bottom or if we go to the very small screen size, you can see we have one column. And if we check our favorites tab, it's working as well. But because there's only two images here, they're being displayed as different sizes. We'll have a look uh, at how to style the cards next. That er everything is nice and consistent. We'll jump back into the code and under the recipe grid, we'll just add a gap before we forget say gap of 2EM. This just adds some spacing between all the recipe grid items. And just below this, we'll say dot recipe card. And then this will be a display flex. We'll say flex direction column. Justify content space evenly so that that we have nice spacing between the image and the title in our recipe card. And I will say background color is going to be white, which stands out against the blue background that we have. We'll add some padding of 1 EM. We'll add a box shadow. We'll say 0, 4 pixels. We'll say 0 pixels, 4 pixels, 12 pixels. And we'll add our GBA value of. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.1. This is just a, um, a value that I generated using the dev tools. You can have a play around with it yourself as well and see just how that works. Then we'll say position relative. And then we'll make this a cursor pointer too so that the user knows that it's that the card is clickable. And then we'll say gap of 1.5 EM. This is just the spacing between our different child elements within the recipe card and now we'll style the text within the card just so that it's a bit bigger and we add some overflow styling say recipe card h3 say font size will be 1 em 5 em margin will be zero because a h3 element comes with at the margins out of the box we just want to get rid of it and Leave the spacing to flexbox. Now we'll say white space, no wrap, overflow, hidden, and text overflow, ellipsis. This basically means don't wrap the text. And if the text is too long that it causes an overflow to trigger, then we're going to add el ellipsis. Now if we save this and Lastly, we'll style. Okay, now, if we save this and jump back to the browser, let's have a look uh, at our app. Yep, we've got the recipe cards in place. And if we look at the favorites, you can see everything's looking a lot more consistent. The last little bit to do is the view more button, which is hidden itself way at the bottom here. We'll jump into our code and go into app.css and we will add view more button and then here we're just going to change the font size to be 1.5 em we'll add some padding to be 1 em we'll change the font width to be bold and we'll say margin auto this prevents the button from taking up the full width of the screen because it's in a flexbox container we just wanted to take up whatever size the text is and it also helps to center itself within the Flexbox container. Now if we look at the browser, you can see at the bottom we have the view more button. And if we click it, hopefully things are still working. And it is. Let's just check the responsiveness. We'll change our screen size. And as we get to the smallest screen, you can see everything 
looks quite good and is usable on mobile. That about wraps it up for this project. If you like this video, don't forget to like, subscribe and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to check out Code Coyotes where there will be more projects coming up in the coming weeks and where you can go to subscribe and stay updated. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.